Welcome, folks, to a very special video. It's another two-part interview with someone who worked on Ace Lightning. This time, I'm interviewing someone who wrote episodes of both seasons of the show, Mark Laren Young. This interview is roughly the same length as my interview with actor Brandon Carrera, so it's broken into two parts. Both parts see us talk about Mark's very, very rich and varied career as a writer, but specifically we cover the early days, and his work on an episode of the Beast Wars Transformers CGI animated series. I love that show. Then for part two, we cover Ace Lightning. I'll say quickly, if anyone out there is watching who was a part of Ace Lightning, in front of the camera or behind it, Mark sends his best regards to you all, as do I. You did amazing work that's really important, and I want you to know this. This interview is an amazing opportunity, and we both had a blast. Before we continue, feel free to like, share, and subscribe to the channel, hitting that notification bell for when my videos go live. Stay tuned to the channel for more Ace Lightning content. So without further ado, let's talk to Mark Laren Young today. So hi, Mark. How are you? I'm great, William. How are you doing? I'm really great, yeah. So um, this is an interview I'm doing with you. I have some questions um, about some of the work that you've done with uh, Ace Lightning is the big one for me. It's one of my favorites from, from when I was a kid. It's really important to me. But also uh, Beast Wars. Wow. Yeah. That should be fun to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I was actually, I was on uh, IMDb, and I think that's uh, that's how I found some of the writers for Ace Lightning, and uh, I saw I saw your photo there, and I found uh, some of your other credits. I'm like, oh, he did Beast Wars. Oh, that's my, that's one of my favorite things ever. I have to, I have to do this. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, I have, uh, I have a few questions just, uh, just here, but, uh, so to break the ice, um, Mark, are, are you familiar with Rush, uh, the rock? band i'm in canada i have to be familiar with rush of course. yeah yeah completely yeah it's but, illegal not to know rush in canada <laughs> yeah no because i'd seen uh, i'd seen your photo i was like yeah he kind of looks like geddy lee from rush just a little tiny <laughs> bit just the, the you know the thing monday warrior mean mean stride today's tom sawyer mean just the the hair going going on. It's it's like a yeah, only this long right now. But oh, no. <laughs> yeah. not it's been longer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But no, it's just exciting to to talk to you. I'm just going to try and keep my my train of my train of thought. It's totally great. So, Mark, um, your um, your your second name, your double your double barreled name, like where where does that come from? Do you know L Laren? Like where does that part come from? Okay, it my it's my stepfather's last name. Oh, so oh, actually, from closer to your part of the world than mine. Mm -hmm. So, Laren's Norwegian. Oh, so apparently, when I've when I've visited his relatives in Norway, I've been told that it's supposed to be more like Laren. I'm going, no, no, Laren's enough. Le but <laughs> yeah, yeah. My mom remarried when I was a kid, and I wanted to take my stepfather's name and change my name to Mark Laren. And was told you can't do that. That's just a phase you're going through. Mm -hmm. And when I, <clears throat> the, basically, the day I became old enough to change my name legally, I was telling all my friends I was going to change my name, and they went, "Are you out of your mind?" Because I was already working as a journalist mm -hmm. as a teenager, and all of them were going, "Laren Young is such a good byline." You know, there are other Larens out there, there are other Youngs out there, but there are no other Laren Youngs in the world. Mm -hmm. So. I went, okay, I'll keep it as a byline, but it won't be my real name. And it's both. No. Right. So, I mean, I, leg I did legally change it, but I actually legally changed it to Laren Young. Uh -huh. No, it's cool. No, I did I did wonder, because I, I thought to myself, is that Scottish? Is that, uh, I thought, could that be Irish? But the the, Le the Laren part. But, uh, no, that's interesting, yeah. that Norwegian. Young is actually one of those... Jewish names that got changed in North America. So it's actually was the same as Weird Al's last name, Yankovic. Um, oh, we see. But that's that predates me. Predates me by a fair bit when it was Yankovic. But uh yeah, so that's the name. That's the name of history. And I interviewed Weird Al and asked if we were related, but apparently our families are from different parts of Europe. My ancestors are from the Ukraine a few generations ago, and I think his were Romanian. Oh, I see. No, I was thinking about what you'd said about your friend, uh, your your good buddy uh, Scott McNeil, the voice of Wolverine in one of the one of the X Men shows. With oh, Scott has been the voice of pretty much everybody. Yeah. And what's really funny is that when Scott and I went to high school together, we actually 
used to goof around and do voices in classes together and make our teachers nuts. And he was so far and away the best actor in my high school in Vancouver that I would write plays with Scott in mind. So like there was one play where I imaginatively actually named the character Scott because I was like, no, only Scott can play this. And then Scott got cast in a real play, couldn't do my play, and I had to take over and play Scott in my play. I did not do a very good job as Scott. Oh, but oh, so much of my earliest work, I cast Scott. Mm. And when I got my very first job in animation, I was hired by uh, Reboot, a show called Reboot. And you know the story behind that was quite wild how I got that gig. But basically, I had written, if you know TV, the best way to break into TV used to be you would write what was known as a spec episode of a TV series. So you'd write a fake episode of a TV series you'd like, and that will be shown as your sample of work. I had written a spec episode of The X-Files because The X-Files was shooting in Vancouver. I had a bunch of friends who were working on it. They said they could get me scripts. Mm -hmm. So I could actually study a script, right? This is pre-internet. You couldn't just get the script of your favorite show. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they could sneak scripts out of the X-Files for me to study it. That's what I'm going to write. So I wrote my own, my spec episode of the X-Files. Somebody at Reboot reads that episode, decides it's great, and that I'm clearly going to be an X-Files writer. And so they hired me to do a parody episode of the X-Files. They wanted that because Gillian Anderson at the time was married to one of the people working at mainframe animation. She was married to one, I think it was one of the animators. And so she was going to do a cameo as Jada Nully in this reboot episode. So they thought, oh, well, if she's doing it, for sure, David Duchovny will do it. David Duchovny was like, there's no way I'm doing a cartoon. I hardly think the FBI is concerned with matters like that. So they went, oh, what are we going to do? Where are we going to find somebody who can play Fax Mulder, who can do the Fox Mulder character? And they were panicking, going, do we just cut him out. I'm like, you can't do x you know, Fox Mulder. And I went, I've got this friend. My friend's named Scott McNeil. He can be anybody. So they called Scott McNeil to try out as Fax Modem, and then he became like just a fixture on Reboot, but also a fixture at Mainframe. Like, it wasn't his first animation gig, mm. but it was one of his early ones. And you mentioned Beast Wars. He was practically everybody in Beast Wars. Mm. And when I wrote the Beast Wars script that I wrote, I actually went to Scott's house and said, I need to know if I got this right. Can you read this for me? Mm. And Scott did every freaking voice. <laughs> so I got a complete read. I, I wish I had a recording of that because I know that Scott has a lot of fans, but he did every single voice in my Beast Wars episode to go, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. No, that doesn't quite sound like that character. And so I had a huge edge writing my Beast Wars episode. And then I wrote, there was another series I'd done in the Vancouver called Dragon Booster. And Scott was like the evil henchman. And I went, I'm ready. I was pitching episodes. And I, went, I pitched an episode where the evil henchman takes over from the bad guy. So he wrote the all Scott McNeil episode of Dragon Booster. They could have a gig. And when I did my first movie, which I directed, Scott actually kicks off the movie. My old man was logger. His old man was logger. His old man fished, but, but he lived in Norway. So. Oh. so we've known each other forever. And I put him in. I, I wrote a stage play where same thing. I needed somebody who could do a jillion voices. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's got to be Scott McNeil. Mm -hmm. So I've written for him for stage. I've written for him for theater. And I've written for him for film. He's, he's a wonderful performer. No, completely. No, uh, there, there's a couple of things. Uh, one one is we, we sort of touched on the first question about your experience working on Beast Wars, which we'll, we'll come to that, where um, I think I've seen a few times like the behind the scenes with the voiceover cast on, on Beast Wars. I have the DVDs. I should have should have dug those out. But in post, I can superimpose those those DVD covers. Oh, cool. Yeah, I know. No, I've watched the show through. And um, yeah, I think because uh, he voiced Dino Bot, I think in that in that show if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Optimus is insane to waste my talents on a futile hunt. I know he was Waspinator. Waspinator, yeah. No, Inferno, not wait for your signal. I remember yeah. him being Waspinator. Yeah. Uh I, I, I can hear I know him so well I can hear his voice when he's yeah, yeah. doing characters. I'll yeah. be watching cartoon and go, ah, it's Scott. 
Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, there are those voice those voice actors like Rob Paulson or Maurice LaMarche or even like um, you know some of the cast of like SpongeBob and you know thing things like that. That that it's it's very clearly them. They have this this range that they have, but you can still kind of pick up on that. They're like, oh, that's fun. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I'm I'm also friends with Gary Chalk, who was in Reboot and Beast Wars as well. He was Optimus Prime. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sorry about your friend. I know how much he meant to you. And I teach a course. Mm. Actually, I briefly took over a very popular course at the University of Victoria. I'm hanging out at the University of Victoria tonight because we've got better Wi-Fi than I do at home. And uh, there's a course built around Pixar Mm -hmm. and storytelling through Pixar. And then out of that, I've actually, I teach courses built around the Marvel universe and the DC universe. But when I was teaching the Pixar course, I brought in Gary Chalk to talk about life as a voiceover actor. I I zoomed him in to my classes and he talked about being Optimus Prime. He's done so much fun stuff with Optimus Prime. Mm -hmm. Because I was going to say that that voice, I thought it's not Peter Cullen. It's definitely, it's, it's, you know, it's its own thing, like listening to Beast yeah. Wars, because like with that show, like the Generation One Transformers, I do really love. Like that's something you know that I'm familiar with, because well, you know who's who's not. But uh, I think Beast Wars might have been the first show. Like I'm actually curious that I really because thought, being but. where you are. Do you pick up the Canadian accent in any of these characters? Do they sound Canadian to you or do they just sound like generically American? When you're a child, you don't really notice this. I think, um, but from what other people have said, like, you know, based on, on the show, um, you know, you do you do kind of pick up on that. And with, uh, it's sort of like touching on Ace Lightning again, because it's uh, it's filmed in, in Toronto, but it's set in, in the United States, it's supposed to be. I don't know. I don't know if they ever. That's how most things in Canada are made. But you, but you pick up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you do, you do pick up on that, like the, you know, that dialect that comes through. It's like ah, it's Canadian. It's a, you know, Canadian yeah. shot, Canadian cast, written by Canadians. You know, uh, for the most, for the most part, yeah. So I, I pick up on that stuff now because I'm more actively looking for that. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh-huh. Now I was going to say since we're doing Beast Wars and you just talked about being Canadian, the Beast Wars story was so I actually pitched it as Tigatron leaves the Beast Wars and moves to Canada. Oh, oh. That, that was part of my pitch. I should I should see if I can dig up the original pitch for it. But with Beast Wars, I had done these two episodes of reboot, so I actually wrote the X Files episode and then I wrote the finale for the second season, and then. I met with the guy at ABC television who became the showrunner for season three, who basically became the story editor for season three. Mm -hmm. And they decided to move the writing to Los Angeles and everything was done in Los Angeles. I was very much in Vancouver. Uh, But the people at mainframe were going, well, we're doing this other show now. We're doing the show called Beast Wars. And I really didn't know much about Transformers at the time. And so I studied it. I watched every episode. And I'm not really great with shows where there's a lot of violence, right? And Beast Wars was like, robots shoot other robots. So I thought, what is a pitch that I could do that is very me? And I came up with, it was like jokingly called the pacifist episode of the Beast, the Beast Wars or the environmentalist episode of the Beast Wars, because my pitch was the kind of pitch you could only make if you didn't know how cartoons worked, right? Because I'd only ever done two in my life. I'd done the two reboots. Mm-hmm. And what happened was I didn't know that you could not kill a character. And I proposed killing a character. And so what I proposed was that Tigatron had a tiger buddy who was an actual tiger. And I thought, what if the actual tiger is killed as collateral damage when the robots are fighting it out? And mm-hmm. Tigatron realizes that the robots can regenerate en- endlessly, but the planet and the animals on the planet can't regenerate. And when they die, they're really dead. Mm-hmm. And I remember writing this line about Tigatron basically drips a tear mm-hmm. made of oil. Oh. when this tiger dies. Snowstalker! And I, I've actually run into people who went, you traumatized me through my entire childhood. I cried during a Transformers episode. <laughs> it's hilarious. I've, like, the response to that have been amazing. Mm-hmm. And like I met uh, John Poser, who directed the episode, and he basically said at one point, do you have any idea what you did for my career? 
because <laughs> that is such a famous episode and I got to tell such a fun story. And it was so hilarious because I remember pitching it to uh, Larry Dottilio at Beast Wars, who's this ridiculously seasoned animation writer. And him sort of explained to me, you're doing things we can't normally do Politically, at the time, there were these lobby groups in the United States who had declared Transformers the most violent show on television. Was it was this in the eighties or? Yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking, the, like the most violent show on on children's television. Uh, wait a few. Not even close anymore. Yeah, right? I don't know. Well, wait, wait, wait a few years until the uh, Power Rangers comes out. Which uh, the funny thing is with um, with Beast Wars, it was very much like animal themed, or you know, like dinosaurs, yeah. and giant bugs for the for the antagonists and the protagonists are more like mammals and stuff like that it's interesting because that that show is ni ni 1997 so uh mark i i would have been one that that year so i didn't see nice. it the first time around uh, that's how young i am but uh but like i i got to grow up on it because it, it gets repeated a lot you know well, it's it was just doesn't do because like what I was told was that because these parents this parents council in the states was protesting it, this episode sort of became see it's about something. So basically, what happened was I got to write this episode, and it was like said known as the pacifist episode of Beast of Beast Wars, and I knew that it had done well because I started reading online. Uh, other people taking credit for it. And I was like, nah, this was 100% my pitch. Mm -hmm. um, I could dig up the pitch document. I can dig up the script that Scott did before anybody saw it, but Scott and I. Uh, but it was such a fun story to write. And if you looked at my stuff, I do a phenomenal amount of environmental writing. Like I host a, I host a podcast about orcas, sharks, the environment, and ocean life. And... People are like, how does that connect the cartoons? Like, it doesn't, except sometimes it does. No, this is the thing about, you know, the varied richness that you have as a writer because, you know, you've tackled so many different kinds of things. And discovering what you do now, I thought, oh, that's very different. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's funny. I've just always loved storytelling and age range doesn't matter to me. You know, the medium doesn't matter to me. The genre really doesn't matter to me. And I'll kind of try anything. So, but it's interesting because I wrote an adult book uh, called "The Killer Whale Who Changed the World" oh, yeah. about the first orca, the, the first orca ever in captivity, and I was approached by one of Canada's top children's publishers, and they went, "Would you consider adapting this for kids? Have you ever written for kids?" I'm like, uh, "Yeah, I've written animation for all ages. Like I've done everything from." preschool to you know the stuff we're talking about today so next thing i knew i was writing a baby book i was writing a book for elementary school kids i was writing a book for middle school kids uh on whales then another one on sharks and right now i'm working on a middle school book about octopus so yeah flipping around a lot it's a lot of fun yeah. no it's crazy talking of um animation and vo uh, going back a little bit talking about voiceovers but um with um with beast wars like i was gonna say that the trend it, it's interesting um thinking about like not so much the transformers franchise but the power rangers franchise you know that was yeah, really, really big in the '90s as well. You know, it's it's interesting because uh, Beast Wars kind of had that nature theme that Power Rangers started with, with their mecha. You know, but uh, the funny thing, Mark, is that uh, I, I don't know if you were familiar with the show in 1997, but they they'd rebranded and it was uh, Power Rangers Turbo, so it was like car themed. So it was kind of the reverse, where like the Transformers are normally cars, and now they're animals in this yeah. this show, and then the Power Rangers. Oh you know became cars for turbo and it's um it's sort of like there wasn't much of a natural progression here like dinosaurs and ancient animals for the first you know season and then like mythic creatures ancient animals for the second one and then like uh, let's think uh, ninja themed stuff with some animal stuff in there as well and then like mysticism and just like robot fighting machines and then cars it's sort of like oh how do we get I should I should mention this about here. Beast Wars. <laughs> One of the things that fascinates me is you get different things that set off Americans versus Canadians. Mm -hmm. And in the States, they tend to censor sex. In Canada, we tend to censor, censor violence. Mm -hmm. So in the States, it's like sex and religion. 
tend to be the, the hot buttons. Here it's violence. So in Canada, we did not have Beast Wars. We had Beasties. I was going to say. You could not have a cartoon name. with the name Wars on it. Mm -hmm. So the Canadian version of the show was, was Beasties. Yeah, which is which is funny because beasties is like a Scottish word for bugs, actually, which is kind of funny. I was thinking that. Yeah, I I, I learned that. I've seen the the bumper or the the alternate tag for it. I'm like, is that a thing? Because it, it's strange as a you know as a Scottish guy what seeing that like that's really really funny in a way that's not intended. You know, I can't remember how I know this or what book I read, but somehow I just. Vaguely remember the term "we beasties" as a Scottish yeah. thing. Yeah, little bugs. Is that so? That's bugs. Yeah, or or like um, yeah, bugs. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. No, the funny thing I was going to say, Mark, is uh, talking of um, of the voice cast, uh, not of not of Beast Wars for a second, but um, with um, with the original X Men cartoon with uh, Cal Dodd, who's the voice of Wolverine, who's actually coming back for X Men '97. So they're going to do a new season of um, of that show, like continuity, and try and bring back. Nice. So I just thought, sold, great, that'll be good. That'll be good to hear Cal's voice again. Because he was on Ace Lightning, that's the big connection uh, to Ace Lightning. He was Random Virus, who's one of the, you know, was kind of between the good side and the bad because he had a split. Yep. And uh, one, of, one of my favorite characters, uh, although he kind of terrified me, but I kind of loved it. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> just Just the way he was able to... You know, to do to do that, like you pitiful scarecrow. Now you're only prolonging your annihilation. You pitiful scarecrow. <laughs> now you're only prolonging your annihilation. <laughs> and then going back to being a good guy, just like Ace, what happened? How'd I get here? Ace, what happened? How'd I get here? You wouldn't believe it if I told you. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you know stuff like that. But no, with with Cal, he um he's uh, he's Canadian though he's uh, Irish born actually, and uh, okay. so Cal is the C C A L is is the name that he goes by. But uh, he was in an interview; it was a audio only. I'll need to send it to you because it's really good. And uh, so uh, the guy interviewing him used his uh, Irish Gaelic name, which uh, it's it's spelt Cathal C A T H A L though i know but it's it's pronounced kahal because you don't you don't pronounce the t so kahal <laughs> and uh, i don't even think i've seen that name before that's great yeah i know it's uh, and i felt really bad because i thought oh no i've been calling him kathal as well but if you don't know how to pronounce that name you know because yeah. he was he was saying to the guy like no, i'm going to stop you right there because you said you said kathal he's like how, how, how do you pronounce your name dude he's like well i, I don't even go by that name <laughs> you know he was he was saying about how um it, it was short to Cal because uh, I think when he was in school he was he was young in uh, Port Dover Ontario and uh, yeah he was like yeah we were all ingrained and the, the kids couldn't pronounce it so Cal goes he goes home he's like mom dad we have to do something about this name because they're they're calling me bovine they're calling me cattle <laughs> and I'm like that's gonna turn to cow so yeah just so he's like so we got rid of cow <laughs> and uh, yeah so just Cal cool yeah. yeah. Honestly, it's in, it's interesting he didn't go with Carl because Carl's closer to Carl, but I guess you just take what's there and you just shrink it and you get Cal. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So uh, I want to say, Mark, because I, I read your your blog post about um, about Beast Wars that you you sent to me a, a little while ago, actually. And no, it was really really informative. You know, just talking about when you were a journalist and you know, kind of what informed the kind of pacifism kind of angle on the on on the character, which does really work because that was kind of what Tigertron was was like. He was a good guy, but he wasn't that much of a fighter. Yeah. Uh, I like I liked him a lot. I had uh, well, not personally, but I knew someone that had like a little Tigertron toy that you could buy, and uh, you can get those like reissues of them. And uh, maybe maybe when this is over, I'll go and I'll just go grab one off eBay. I'm like, oh, this is good. Yeah, I've actually picked up Tigertron toys at conventions here and stuff like that. Cause I'm like, yeah, that's my guy. 
Yeah, yeah. But no, we kind of uh, we kind of talked about your experience working working on Beast Wars. But uh, I understand that um, you kind of uh, did. You feel you learned about like the pitching process for how these things tend to tend to work, and it's like you have to keep coming up with ideas and. Oh yeah, uh, but so much of that was basically written by the guys who created it. Yeah. So it's like I did the episode, everybody was happy, and then it was like, yeah, we're you know, there's really nothing to pitch. Mm. because they had, you know, they sort of had their stable of writers and the team at mainframe was, you know, going, well, you, you got your episodes like, great. And I, I moved, to, I'm trying to remember this. I think I moved to Toronto fairly soon after that as well. Um, and started writing cartoons there, which is how I ended up with Ace. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But if you'd asked me two years earlier, I had no idea that we had any cartoons being made in Canada. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I'd never written for TV. I, oh. I got my first, you know, animation job out of doing uh, stage comedy. Mm -hmm. So most of the TV that I knew in Canada was stuff that was like service productions. So American shows shot in Canada. Yeah. So I, I knew which American shows shot in Canada were there. there were a handful of Canadian shows. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing that ever really felt like my kind of thing. Like, even if I watched it, nothing felt like the kind of thing I wrote, but cartoons instantly. Like, as soon as I was like, hang on, I can write superhero stories? I'm so in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? That was just so exciting. Mm -hmm. I was like, immediately, I was going, I did not know that this was a life option for me, that I could write superhero stories. That was just so cool right it's like this is my favorite thing ever and you know here here's an avenue for for that pretty much i i had assumed it was all written in america mm -hmm. right so i had assumed you had to live in la mm -hmm. and then reboot sure enough basically moved over to la mm -hmm. uh, and i mean i had this phenomenal meeting with um like i said the guy who took over reboot dan didio who eventually took over dc comics Years later, Dan actually let me pitch a Batman, but I my timing was off because they were about to launch the new 52. So I pitched something that made no sense with the new 52. No. But it was amazing to me that I was actually pitching a Batman comic. It was very weird. I had this huge collection of comic books. And after I pitched a Batman, I was like, I don't think I need the collection anymore. I almost got rid of Batman. And I also got to write uh, a Moon Knight series but not the Moon Knight series that eventually made it on TV. No, no. There was an attempt to do a live action Moon Knight for Marvel. Um, long before Oscar Isaac, yeah. Long before, long before the MCU, uh -huh. where it was spinning out of the Blade TV series. And then we're going to do a Moon Knight TV series. Well, I know with, with Moon Knight, like a lot of the characters, the, the difficulty, you know, it's not a, a problem now, but like crossovers, because uh, I think he interacted a lot with Spider-Man, which obviously... You know, you can do that now, kind of, but um, yeah, it's it's sort of like the it, it's defined a lot by like the shared universe stuff, which we've come to know and really love now in the movies and stuff. But like, it's sort of like um, you know, I know with the MCU when it began, there's a good behind the scenes with the first Iron Man movie talking about we've got ambitions to do a, a cinematic universe. What do we have the rights to? It's like okay, we don't have Spider Man, we don't have the Fantastic Four. We don't have the X-Men, we do now, but we didn't have those then. And it's like, well, we've always had the rights to Nick Fury and, you know, everything else pretty much, like Captain America and Iron Man, you know, Hulk. They were able to negotiate strenuously with Universal Pictures. And, you know, it's sort of like we, we've got what we've got. Let's try and mingle them all and just take that idea with what's here, you know, in-house. Teaching a course here in the Marvel Universe, it's interesting to explain to students <clears throat> yeah, Iron Man was not a big deal character. Now the movies have happened. Now he's the guy. Yeah. But prior to the movies, Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America—they were the B list man. Mm -hmm. they, like the A list, they didn't have the rights to. Mm -hmm. It was Spider Man. It was Elektra. It was X Men. Yeah. It was Wolverine. Yeah. All right. Uh, and it's fascinating now to go. You know, because of the way the MCU built, mm -hmm. the phenomenal shift of. Iron Man suddenly becoming a superstar. Uh -huh. Hulk, you know, Hulk becoming a bigger deal. These were all characters whose comics kept getting canceled. Oh, man. Right? Like the number of times those comics got canceled when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, and, or they didn't have their own comics initially. And yeah, they turned into, you know, they were in Tales from Astonish or whatever. It does explain right? a lot because there was kind of a stark 
with the uh, with the movies i know like um they took a lot of influence from like 60s marvel you know for you know yeah. about the iron man movies but also uh, like you know the new avengers like stuff from the time like the 2000s stuff like uh you know so it sort of explains like the the cut from one to the other because as you say yeah. they kept getting cancelled but also like we'll go with what's most relevant but like yeah with iron man i think for the most part no one really cared or knew who he was until the movie i know for me i'd seen yeah. when the iron man movie came out i knew who he was because of the spider man cartoon actually because they crossed over I'm like, yep. oh, where War Machine comes in, it's like, we've got to bring him back up. Who? The guy named Iron Man. <laughs> but um, with Beast Wars, we, we've talked uh, you know, about your experiences working on that and what kind of informed it. But do you feel that carried forward, like the pitching idea, you know, into other other things that you've done where it's like things things don't necessarily come to you as a writer like you know you have to you know you, you have to go and set up your ideas and stuff well beach wars like i hadn't really thought about it until you asked but beast wars was the first time i'd ever pitched uh -huh. because i was invited to do the reboot right like they basically what happened with the reboot was because they'd read my x files they went would you do this parody episode of x files and most of the stuff that was shifted from my original script was because I didn't understand the things you couldn't, couldn't do in CGI yet. Mm -hmm. So I, in the original version of my script for a reboot, I had a character called the smoking can after cancer man, Bill Davis uh, from the X-Files did not realize that one of the hardest things to do in animation or in, in CGI at the time, smoke, water, fire. Mm -hmm. So of course, what I pitched to transformers was fire. Right, like I really, because nobody bothered to explain that to me, because this was the beginning of CGI, I and mean, this was happening same time as Pixar was launching, right? So this was pioneering CGI, this, from the people who did the Dire Straits music video that launched the idea of CG animation. So I did that, which was a request, and then while I was doing that, we were talking about characters and I, because I am a comic nerd, I get obsessed with backstory. I get obsessed with the characters, like the forgotten characters. If you watch most episodes of TV that I've written, I'll choose a side character to feature because I'll, I will go back. I'll watch every episode. I'll read the Bible and you'll so often see that there was something they were in love with that never made it into the show. And that becomes my pitch. I'll pitch the, who's the character who's underused, right? Who's the character that somebody clearly loved and then forgot about? And those tend to be my pitches. But what happened was I started asking about the Guardians in Reboot. And I said, what's their deal? And they said, really, they're just Bob's boss. And we started talking about that. And I said, look, are you, I'm serious comic nerd. And as a comic nerd, I've always loved Green Lantern. And I've always thought that the Guardians in Green Lantern are raging assholes. Oh. And this was before they actually did a series where they became that. But I always, I never liked them. So I said, what if the Guardians in Reboot are raging assholes? And they loved that pitch. Like I, remember, like I vividly remember sitting in this conference room and then went, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. So next thing I knew... I was being asked to turn my episode into a two-parter, which was the series finale. They already knew what they wanted to do. They were like, they knew that they were getting canceled off ABC. They knew they were going to end with a big war. They informed me that they were going to kill off Bob, who was the lead character. And so they basically went, here are the pieces, put them into the story. So I thought that was how TV worked. Yeah. And then I was invited to do Beast Wars. And they said, so what story is you pitching? And I went, what do you mean what story is I pitching? And I went and like, it's funny, this is now a trick I teach writing students. It's like, I went and looked up like every classic Western story because all of the plots are in classic Western somewhere. Mm -hmm. the, the, if you ever doubt that, watch Mandalorian and the entire first two seasons, you can play name that classic Western. Oh, 100%. now they're doing yeah. Stagecoach. <clears throat> now they're doing Shane. Yeah. Now they're like, like they've done every single Western in Mandalorian. Yeah. I was like, okay, what <clears throat> things I like? So I pitched like an enemy mind version of what, of like, I didn't always know 
where the, the original stories had come from, right? Yeah. In my early 20s, it's like, like I pitched all of these different stories and I can't remember how many I had all together. But then I remember it was like, Tigatron leaves the Beast Wars, moves to Canada, um, you know, and that the pitch that got made into the story. Mm-hmm. And they just, I really do think what they liked about it, my understanding was that what they liked about it was that, like I said, no one who understood how cartoons worked would have thought to pitch and now we kill a character. Mm-hmm. And the really the unforgettable moment for me of working on Beast Wars was having this phone call with Larry Detilia where we were talking about whether one character's heat powers could beat Tigatron's cold powers. Yeah, yeah. And I just started laughing and laughing and laughing. And he said, what's so funny? And I went, I, I'm so sorry, but I remember having this argument about Iceman versus Human Torch when mm. I was a little kid. Mm. And I was like with David Cates, like my, my childhood friend David Cates, playing on his jungle gym. Yeah, yeah. And getting into arguments over whether Human Torch could beat Iceman. I was Team Iceman. He was Team Torch. Mm-hmm. And I also argued that Green Lantern could beat Superman with enough willpower, right? And going, oh my God, I am being paid to have this argument with an adult, this is like the best thing in my life ever. I remember reading uh-huh. that in your, your post. I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. really amazing. You know, it just to be right. Like, that, yeah. yeah, I couldn't remember if I put that in my post, but I really do. I vividly recall that moment going, this is like the best thing in my life ever. And I remember when I got it, when I've been working in TV for years, and I remember I had a TV agent and I said, seriously, if I ever, ever complain about getting to write cartoons, let me go because it means I've forgotten why I write. Oh, right. Like just cut me loose because I just don't deserve to do it anymore because it's just like, seriously, I'm getting paid to make believe superheroes. It is so great. Mm. Right. What a great thing to get to do. No, so, that's, that's golden. That's, that's all in there. I do yeah. really love that part, but we'll see, we'll see what happens with the, you know, what they end up doing with their movies now, because, uh, you know, Iceman versus Human Torch, you know, we could have a little brawl there because we can, we be- could actually now my favorite though, Mark, when I say favorite, my idea was to have like an interaction similar to the first Avengers where Iron Man, Captain America and Thor meet, but instead have Hulk and, and beast and the thing you know just see what we could you know what we could do with that oh that would be that fun would, yeah can we get george boozer back that, that, that would be great user that works he has a little cameo in the first x-men actually he's a truck driver at the beginning oh cool i thought you said you're gonna take me as far as laughlin city this is laughlin city We'll be able to maybe see some some people, like the new shows or the new movies, just to see if we can, just like a little Easter egg for fans of the, the cartoon. Yeah. To be like, have Cal Dodd, you know, somewhere in the background or like, you know, other other people like that, who, whoever we can do. I'm like, that's that's really fun. Yeah. So, uh, Mark, it's been out for a few months now. It'll probably be on streaming, but uh, they made a new uh, Transformers movie, the uh, Transformers Rise of the Beasts film. One of my questions that I've listed is I asked you if, if you were excited to see that. and I, I think I actually I, did I want to see it, but I haven't checked it out yet. No, I, I think I had to tell you that, that, that it existed. I think you said, did not know this was happening. I'm like, oh, fun. I knew there was a new Transformers. I had no idea it was, it was the Beasts. Yeah. So I really do want to check that out, but I haven't seen it yet. I would recommend seeing it because, no, I I did enjoy it quite a bit, but I thought to myself, this isn't really a movie, you know, without spoiling anything, really. This isn't a movie necessarily made for me as a fan of Beast Wars because it's trying to be its own thing, for one, which you have to do. But also it's like, it's a movie that they happen to be in rather than it just being about them because some of the Generation 1 characters are in there, I think, just to try and make try and bridge bridge the gap between the two where it's like we have to committee thinking we have to have the familiar stuff in there and I, I was watching it and kind of laughing to myself I saw it with a friend thinking that you know the idea is the tagline is robots in disguise, robots in disguise. 
you know the transformers and i was looking at the you know the cgi for the for the beast characters i thought this looks really awesome this looks really cool but i thought you know they they don't blend in i thought they don't they they look like the robot cheetah looks like a robot cheetah it doesn't look like a real cheetah the same with optimus primal and i just thought congratulations guys in in neither of your forms do you blend in you know i'm like this it's kind of weird to you know like objectively this i thought this doesn't work but i'm like i i don't care i, I don't care yeah. it's, still, it's still fun but uh you know a question, I suppose, is uh, have you seen many of the Paramount Pictures uh, Transformers movies, the Michael Bay ones? Like, do you have you a seen a few of them? I haven't watched a ton of them. I haven't watched, oh. like, I haven't watched all of them, mm -hmm. but I've seen a few. They're fun. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not, they're not really my thing. No, no. The we Marvel stuff, yeah. The DC stuff, yeah. Hit and miss. Yeah. No, I just ask because with with the Michael Bay films, full disclosure, folks, this this uh, video is not sponsored by Paramount or anything like that. But like, uh, and if it, and if it were, I'm failing badly because like with the Michael Bay films, I think I gave up after number three just because it was really long and overblown, and I just thought, Ugh. you know, because I, I I was a kid, I, I enjoyed the first two, and then I thought it's difficult to keep getting invested because I, I felt the i felt the formula come through and i'm like there's no yeah. story progression here when there really could be whereas like you know like marvel movies they're able to do that yep but yeah the bizarre thing was uh this doesn't spoil the beast wars movie but they kind of at the very end they had uh our our main guy is handed this card and it's like you know join us call us and the calling card, it says G.I. Joe. I was like, G.I. Joe, are you? Oh, it's another Hasbro brand. I'm like, this is kind of funny. You know, it's like the, the cross pollination. Like, let's yeah. uh, throw another one of our toy brands in there. I thought, but where, where is this going? I thought, I'd love to see a good crossover, uh, you know, a crossover with the Hasbro stuff that they have. Yeah. Like, is this going to be a thing? I don't know. Uh, it was just just a funny funny little moment <laughs> but no i'd recommend i'd recommend seeing it you know just just cool. uh, you know see what they ended up doing because it, it was it was pretty cool but i don't i don't know where where this is going welcome to part two of my interview with mark laren young here we talk about his experiences working on ace lightning this whole interview had some really juicy stuff in it though this is where it gets really 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 juicy so stay tuned just as a heads up this part of the interview picks up right from the previous one, so the backgrounds stay the same, though what comprises the last 30 minutes of this video, that was shot at a later date, and so that's why Mark's background looks different for that segment. I've cut this video so it flows right into that, despite these changes, talking about this now saves me explaining it later on. So folks, enjoy. But Mark, so my question, uh, what was your experience like working as a writer on Ace Lightning? Ace was kind of... Ace was kind of a dream come true gig because it was my first chance to work on total all out superheroes. And again, I have the most vivid memory of getting this gig because I'd moved to Toronto not long before and I had met an executive at the company that was producing Ace. And he said, there's this sh new show. They're interviewing writers. I'm going to line up a meeting for you with the showrunner, Rick Sigelko. And I was a last second addition to the interviews, right? So I was not supposed to be in the interview list. It was just really interesting timing. So I have this meeting. My memory says it was Alliance Atlantis or Alliance. Uh, yay. So have this meeting with, with an executive there who went, I think you'd be good for this show. So I'm going to set up this meeting. So every other person who went to the meeting, they had the Bible, they had probably the pilot, did all the stuff around, just moving this around because I've got a weird background in front of me because I'm in somebody else's office. Oh, it's cool. It, it looked like I had computers sticking in my ears. So um, I have this meeting. I remember going to a diner to meet Rick Sigelko. And I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. Nobody's told me anything about the show beyond it's superheroes. So he starts to describe the show to me and he's breaking it down. And I couldn't help myself. The words came out of my mouth. And as soon as I said them, I thought, I'm so not getting this job because I said, oh, wow, you're doing the first year of Spider-Man. 
And he went, what? I said, that screen got, like, I just started listing off all the characters. Mm-hmm. I went, you're hitting all of the classic beats of season one, of, of the first year, the the origin of the Spider-Man. And he looked at me, and I thought, like, my, my thought was, he's going to kick me out either for being such a nerd or for suggesting this. And he went, actually, I was working on this pitch with my neighbor, Dennis O'Neill. And my eyes light up. And I go, oh, my God, Danny O'Neill? Do you know Danny O'Neill? Because Batman, that was my thing as a kid, right? Like Batman comics. And Danny O'Neill is one of the first names that I learned when I realized that people made comics, right? When I kind of put together that there were writers and artists who did the comics, and the comics didn't just exist. Danny O'Neill was the name that I knew. So I just, like, completely lit up. Uh, and suddenly we were jamming on comics. And we, yeah, we started talking about what made Spider-Man, like what made Spider-Man happen. And it really was because I'm going, oh, you're doing this character and this character and this beat and this beat. And I recognized all of them because um, like this is my happy place. And we just talked forever. And the funniest thing was one of the first people I met who wrote for TV, who told me what it was like, wonderful, wonderful animation writer and writer, got him Steve Westron. And Steve and I would get to go up for the same jobs because we both had a comedy background. We both had a cartoon background, but he had done so much more than me. So I would walk into a job, I'd do the interview, and then he and I would go for lunch. And of course, he got the job. Like always, 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 Steve got the job. And like, I came out of this interview, this is so much fun, and I got a call later that day from Steve, and he went, I just did one of the worst job interviews I've ever done, and I think it was your fault. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? He said, I just walked into this job interview for this show called Ace Lightning, and all the showrunner could talk about was how he'd met this comic nerd right before me, and they nerded, and they just talked comics for an hour. Mm-hmm. And he went, that was you, wasn't it? <laughs> I went, yeah. He said, I definitely did not get that job. He said, I'm pretty sure you did. So I knew before, I knew I'd done okay before I actually got the word saying that I had the gig. Mm-hmm. And Rick was just amazing to me after that. And really kind of took advantage of the fact that this was my world. I mean, I had 15,000 comics at one point as a collector. Like, I was still collecting, I was still actively collecting comics when I was living in Toronto. You know, they were sitting, you know, they were sitting in piles in Vancouver. So most of the collection was in Vancouver that I'd be buying comics in Toronto and stacking them up in a department which did not have room for my comic collection. Oh. Uh, or, the, or the comics, that, never mind the comics I was buying in Toronto mm-hmm. and stacking up. So... It was hilarious, but we just sort of broke down. And what kind of happened with Ace, and when you look at the stories that I got, frequently it was if they were hitting a really classic superhero beat. So if you look at my stories, if it was revealing the secret identity beat, Rick would go, okay, you're the nerd. You go do that. I am Kilobyte, the Cyber Stalker. The giver and taker of evil. And that's also how I got the season finale that turned into the series finale. Mm -hmm. He went, I think you can do something that'll make people cry with this. He said, I'm going to give this to you. So the episodes that I got were, you know, it was an amazing gift because there were real freaking comic book writers on that. Like, I met Alan Grant at a meeting that he did. I'm like, oh my God. I mean, like, I mean, somebody's written Justice League, right? Like, it was, like, I totally fanboyed. And I, I, I'm actually 100% sure I got the job because I fanboyed when I heard the, the name Daddy O'Neill. And I couldn't stop myself, right? Like, I just assumed I was doomed. The minute I nerded out and said that Spider-Man, year one, I just thought, well, I'm not getting the job. I may as well have fun. Oh, no. <laughs> no, but it happened. It really worked. It was no, yeah. it's amazing. It's an amazing story. You know, it's such enthusiasm, but it's it's weird, you know, Mark, because I, I was asking Matt Fickner, actually, who is, uh, you know, an amazing friend, or he, you know, he calls me his friend, so I'm like, oh, that's really sweet, that's really great. Oh, he's lovely, he's the artist. Yeah, he's the he's guy. He's a, just amazing. 
there, there's two there's two little stories there uh, that, that overlap one is that um for one thing matt is a is a big inspiration to me as a creative person and you know i yeah. had the uh the chance to to interview him and i didn't record it i wasn't you know able to at, at that point so but at the same time it's like a little conversation we were able to have but you know i told him how important he is to me and how uh you know i do art i studied it because I think because of his his design work in Ace and, you know, it kind of sparks that creativity when you're young. And there's so many other things as well that, you know, that, you know, motivated me. But I thought that's probably the first like really big one. So it's like meeting my legitimate hero. It's like you're the guy. It was such, it was such clever art. Yeah. Right. The, the concept art was so strong. Mm, I did wonder about, you know, how influential the Marvel and DC comics were to, you know, to the character designs, you know, not so much the characters as written, but like you can kind of like with random virus who we were talking about, you know, you can kind of feel like the two face, you know, influence coming through or it's like, a two face green goblin thing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, green. Yeah. Green goblin Joker, you know, for different characters like uh, Mark Hollander, I think was, you know, specifically influenced by Peter Parker, you know, and, um, you know, so that that one, that one we can say for sure. But uh, he was talking about how, um, you know, despite those parallels that people like us can draw, you know, uh, the audience watching, like designing the characters, those weren't terribly influential in how they in how they looked. But um, I think with Matt, it was uh, more like 80s cartoons that really influence what he was doing like lord fear yeah. you know like skeletor from he-man and uh, ninja turtles is another one for like anvil and uh, pig face it was more like in that sort of you know that sort of realm and uh, i know like the horror genre is really influential to matt but uh, you know like with random virus he was telling me that uh, he wanted him i think to look like the thing at one point like john carpenter's the thing with the nice. robot, i know with the robot parts like kind of sprouting from him you know kind of and there's kind of a bit of that with the uh, caterpillar tracks that he has he has like these pincers that kind of come from the sides so i'm like oh yeah i can kind of see like artifacts of that coming through i want to see the concept art for that so badly but uh, i thought also it plays off like the multiple personality thing you know him looking that way i thought no that's really great no because matt uh, i know worked on the 2011 thing actually cool i know i'll need to need to ask him about that that sometime if uh, you know if if we can talk about that so mark i have some goodies i can show you it's a merchant cool yeah it's a merchandise from ace lightning which i think uh, was actually only available in the uk you know, for for the most part, as far as I know, but oh, neat! So I have um, I have something here. We'll just get one of these here. So this one, one of my favorite books ever. So this is the Ace Lightning Guide Book. Let me show you this here. Oh, cool! Aha! Uh -huh, I know. I do love this purple. Th this isn't my own personal copy. This is one I, I collected. There's there's a few different ones. Like uh, it had this Lord Fear poster in the back, which uh, to my dismay isn't included and in, uh, included in this one but we've got uh, i can put that in in post but uh no my own personal copy i had um it's it's purple and what i ended up doing was peeling away some of the purple on the back you can't see it on this yeah. it's not that copy but i was showing brandon carrera like i think i was just curious because I, I was a kid i was like what's this oh oh dear <laughs> but anyway <laughs> yeah i get that mm, no i'll show you some stuff but uh, I was thinking about what you'd said about the finale, about how um, the idea was, uh, let's see if we can uh, see if we can make them cry with this ending. And true enough, that's exactly what happened. You know, that's good. That's it there. <laughs> yeah, certainly like Ace, you know, definitely was really, you know, was really destroyed by, by that, by spoilers, the death, the death of Lady Illusion. Oh. Yep. Oh man, I'll just get this here. So though the book here, it's got like character bios and uh, there's a funny bit with Lady Illusion. Let's see if I can find this here. I think I've gone right past it. But I thought I have this stuff here that, um, you know, these bits of uh, history. I thought I'll show Mark some of this. This will be fun. Here we go. There you go. So Lady Illusion. Cool. Uh -huh. 
there. So I'll just see if I can. You see okay? Yep. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, I wonder if I think they took freeze frames from the from the show from the CGI models and like put that into the book because I was rewatching I was rewatching the show and there's uh, like poses that Ace has and I was I was watching and like that's the cover of the the DVD or the you know the the video game that they ended up making and like oh that's cool kind of sourcing it from that but uh, this is a good part where it's Lady Illusion talking about herself. She's like, my special power is the ability to morph into anything I want. I can be a puny human teacher or a dog. I could even be the book you're reading now. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm like, is that, does the physics of that work? I thought, can you not, I thought, can you be something inanimate? Probably not, but, uh, <laughs> oh, gee. But talking about random virus from before, let's, uh, yeah, here we go. We've got our hero poses of the good guys. Yep. There's random. You see it? Now, one of my, one, one of my favorites. Yeah, something with Ace Lightning is I, I do really love the, the good guys, but I also really love the bad guys as well, just, you know, in terms of the character designs. I was telling Matt Fickner this, and uh, it's like, yeah, this is all really important to me. And another one, I'll just get this here, is the 2003 Ace Lightning yearbook, which is 20 years old this year. There you go. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Yeah, Ace kind of has the Superman pose going on. Definitely. Yeah, but with posters talking of, I've got one in here, poster in the back of Ace and Lord Fear. Let's get this. There you go. Cool. Yeah. No, some good, uh, good stuff in here. Some good puns. Let's see. Yeah, one of one of the actors uh, I've got here. It's uh, Miss, Mr. Chesbro, played by R. D. Reed, who's uh, sadly not not with us any longer. But one of uh, one one of my favorites in the show from uh, rewatching it just here. This guy. Yeah, that's cool. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, gee. I do always, always love this, and this was uh, this information was listed on Ace Lightning Wikipedia because there is an Ace Lightning wiki. <laughs> there, I thought I need to uh, need to add in some more information to that page. <laughs> but uh, it was asking. It's got like character bios, and with Mr. Chesbro, the first thing is his age, and it says here no spring chicken. Hmm. <laughs> oh man. So I'm like, I guess we never figured that one out. <laughs> Oh dear, this aged, crazy, crazy teacher guy. <laughs> no, I'll need to show you some more, uh, you know, show you some proper stuff as well out of that. But also, Mark, I have some toys, actually, that were based on the character designs from Ace yeah. Lightning. There is a Lord Fear toy, though to my dismay, I wasn't able to find that one on, on the internet, though I was able to get a hold of everything else. So the first one here is Anvil. Here we go. Oh, wow. You know, I know the cool thing is his uh, anvil hand here has a little button. You can press that. I'll just get the hand out of the way and press this. There you go. It's a little click. Oh, yes. Whoop. So the anvil guy with his iconic garbage can lid shoulder. Now, with Anvil, I did wonder if, uh, you know, the rhino could have been influential from Spider-Man just because of the species. Yeah. But uh, I think, I don't know, like, why a rhino exactly was, was set upon. I think because of the carnival or, like, the circus theme, it's got, you know, like a, you know, circus animal, I suppose. But uh, they thought, well, we won't go for the most obvious, you know, thing, like a lion or, like, a zebra or something. You know, we'll vary that one up. <laughs> Another one here. Here we are. Is pig face. There we go. Yeah. Got this here. Oh, that face. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Pig face with his big face. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. No, it's very accurate to the show, you know, how they were able to get, you know, these models to look yeah. so, you know, so close to it. 
because I know I, I actually have some of uh, Matt's drawings that he'd sent me. I have a few, you know, on my wall, which is like the, the most amazing thing. And like, thank you so much, Matt, you know, for this. But you can see some of the um, the design, like development, you know, how they went from here to there. But, you know, it's based on the TV show. And Rat, I'll just bring in Rat. Here we go. Yeah. And Rat. Yeah. That's cool. cool. Aha, I'll bring this one in a little closer. No, the cool thing about this dude is, uh, just bring this up, is his, uh, his wings can flap. Show you. Those are really elaborate. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's weird, you know, because it's so, you know, close to the design of the, of the show as well. And th this is kind of another one that reminds me of the thing, you know, the more I think about it, you know, the way the wings kind of sprout out of there. Kind yeah. of, more so in the show, it's evident, but then like his tail, like a giant worm. I always kind of thought, like, he's so gross and horrible. I love it. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite designs, you know, just like the rat and the clown suit and the nose and the makeup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, also, another one here. We have Ace. Here he is. Ooh. I know. Those are just really well articulated. Yeah. No, these crop up on eBay occasionally. I have some uh, clones of uh, of these just for like, uh, you know, comparison's sake. But uh, no, I could maybe send, you know, I could maybe send you one of, you know, one of these, you know, once um, I'm going to make a few videos about the about the toys, just kind of compare the two and be like, OK, folks, I'm going to auction these off. Who wants them? Who wants them? <laughs> cool. Yeah. No, the fun thing is he has the amulet on his back, which is accurate to the show as well. I do love that. Yeah. Mm. I think he had little projectiles for his wrists because it's got kind of a, you know, spring thing on the side. You know, although I've not seen anything that went in there. Like, I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure what that would have been because it's got kind of a space just here. Hmm. Yeah, he's missing his belt that he had, but, uh, you know, and the little bit of paint chipping on the shoulders. But at the same time, like, I have it. I found them here. <laughs> mm. Mm. It's apparent that designing Ace, I think Matt Fickner drew like a, like a self-portrait, if you like, of himself uh, wearing this kind of leather jacket and the, you know, body armor that he has. <clears throat> among other you know concepts and that's where you know we ended up for the for the character it's like so matt is ace lightning oh that's cool yeah yeah no it is it's interesting how um you know the merchandise didn't didn't exist in in canada or you know most other countries i thought oh it doesn't oh man you know because the show itself and some of the the byproducts of that just were really important to me yeah uh-huh but no, I know the uh, the superhero genre is a big part of Rick's thinking, and I think uh, Spider Man was his favorite superhero. And I think yeah. uh, his brother, he was saying, actually had all all of the comics, you know, or at least you know up, up to a up to a certain point, I guess. But it's like, no, I found them. I found them all. <laughs> nice. Yeah, even Spider Man One, you know, I think from Amazing Fantasy. So you know, it's a it's a big part of his thinking, and so Ace Lightning came you know, all, all from him. I'm like, this vision, so great. <laughs> so I was thinking, Mark, about what you'd said about some of the, um, you know, some of the writing choices that, that you've made about taking, like, you know, not smaller characters, but like taking characters and then kind of giving, yeah. them, you know, kind of giving them, you know, stories that they, they can run with. And it sort of leads into one of the Ace Lightning questions I've got just here. So we'll get cool. here. There you go. In Ace Lightning, I sometimes saw things like urban legends and conspiracy theories, like extraterrestrials or UFO sightings uh, being satirized in episodes that you wrote, as well as the show overall. Is that something you wanted to do as a writer on the show? Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, remember, I sort of accidentally started my career writing an X-Files episode, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. writing the spec X-Files episode. So playing with that was my, was my thing. And I mean, looking back over some of these episodes, the stuff that I actually pitched versus the stuff I think Rick just went, would you do this? Like there's a theater episode. Of course I pitched a theater episode. You know, I'm a theater kid, mm -hmm. right? So Time of Love, I think may have been his, may have just been straight up. Somebody was going to write that. Mm -hmm. um, pretty sure the plays, the thing was me going, 
kind of do a theater episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so there are certain things that would sort of be a go-to pitch for me. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, radioactive guy would very much be like my wheelhouse. The legend of the radioactive guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And was it was it difficult because it it's based on Phantom of the Opera? Like that wasn't like a there, there wasn't like a rights issue or anything like that to try and do like a school play. Of Phantom that. definitely not right. It's public domain. Doing yeah, yeah. once you take Lloyd Webber's songs, you're in trouble. But yeah, but none of that. I am the Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> I actually just found something while you were talking that I thought you may get a kick out of, especially because of where you are. Um, when we first started writing this, one of the things we we received, and I just found this in my files, was a lexicon of words and phrases, British to American, and American words rarely used in British with our meanings. I do not know who wrote this, okay? I just know this is in my Ace Lightning files, and it's a memo to Rick that he shared with us. So the phrases are taking the mickey, yes. chuffed, sausage, good show, stoked, bugger, no. give us a ring or ring me, feeling peckish, lippy, a word that I've never heard before, which is kushti. Kushti hey, is like all good, like cool, but that's that's more of an English. That's like a London slang. Oh, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be kushti. Yeah, that that one I don't know. Waistcoat, sleeveless top, vest, miffed, shagged out, knackered, nappy, minging, pong, trainers, flimsels, fag for cigarettes. Yeah, naughties. That's a that's a word that I did not know. Hoover, cello tape. Tip, jammy, tart, turf accountant, betting shop, high street, corner, news agents, which translates here as 7 Eleven store. I've got the translations for all of these. Mm-hmm. I'll send this to uh, Off license, roundabout, tube, a lot of words for liquor for a kid show. Chips, frog, courgette, for zucchini, yeah, on yeah. the dole. And then American words rarely used in British with our meanings. That blows. Bummer. Very bad. Bummer is a gay guy. This would shock Mark have used. Oh. That sucks. Roddy, dweeb, geek, sneakers, neat, swell, blocks, and easy street. So these were translations we received. I don't think I ever looked at those. Oh. <laughs> but I, I think I may have just looked at those now. Mm. But I was just going, oh, wow, while you were talking about I should dig up my old files. Mm. And the other thing, you prob- you must know this, but the original name of Ace was Captain, right? Yeah. There was Captain Lightning. I'm just looking at all my old scripts. And mm. All of my old scripts refer to Captain Lightning. Mm. It does have in the credits uh, Captain L Productions, though, which uh, it has it's kind of like an artifact of that. I think. Yeah. I think for season two, it was uh, Captain L two or something, something like that. It yeah. Was like, a, like like a sequel name to that. Yep. Well, I know also like uh, you know coming up with character names, you know, for who the characters were. Like Matt actually sent me a letter talking about his character designs about how, uh, for example, Pigface, you know, had a different name. I think this was a character that was that they had in the script that was designed quite early on, like all the way through, but Pigface's original name was um, uh, Lord Vulgar. That was his name. Yeah, which I'm sure, as I'm sure you know, I'm sure you remember. And uh, Anvil, again, uh, Lord Brutal was Anvil's, uh, you know, name, working name. And cool. I'm, yeah, these are, you know, I think all the bad guys um, had titles like Lord and Lady by, by the end, but uh, I was saying to Matt Fickner that it's cool that um, it, it works better this way, that it's Lord Fear and Lady Illusion, you know, have their titles, and then the rest of the bad guys have, um, you know, just like a name. I was like, th- those are some amazing names, but uh, no, it's still cool what they ended up going for. Oh, we were just talking. I just found my notes for my first pitch, or for an early pitch of plays, the thing. Yeah, yeah. Where my note to Rick is, so as I started playing out the different dangles, the big challenge is actually to find a play with a romantic triangle with two women and one guy plus a monster. Most monster plays create the triangle with a monster from another guy, and most of them like Beauty and the Beast. Monster's a good guy. 
Uh, I also know from our conversations it started in part because of the gag of Chuck getting replaced by Pink Face. So I kept coming back to Phantom because the monster ain't the good guy. And I saw a way to create a triangle with Heather and Sam and a cool reveal. Mm. And I screwed with the story a bit because I thought it would be fun to give them their own high school twist. If you think the twist is too silly, I can make it go away, but I think it might crack you up. Uh, then I did a technical note. Again, theater nerd, but I also did a lot of magic as a kid, or I worked on magic shows. Theater flash pots are pretty standard. One of the things that cracked me up when I first saw Phantom was that I've used a lot of the same illusions when I produced a play at age 18. The fire shooter, I've suggested as an illusion, I used at age 16. I started on theaters. I mean, magician it's actually harmless and kid friendly it's a mechanism that attaches to a finger like one of spider-man's web shooters mm -hmm. and basically I talk about how this 15 dollars device is treated like the most the biggest illusion in phantom of the opera if you've ever seen it on stage mm -hmm. and i basically put it should be available at any at any match shop in toronto because so often when you're doing something like that i know that somebody's reading this and going Oh, it's an expensive special effect. So there are my notes saying it's not an expensive special effect. It's a $15 gag you can get in the magic shop. <laughs> there, there is kind of a, like, like a special effect like that in the, in the final, you know, episode where Chuck has that, you know, like bomb that goes off and then like the smoke, you know, happens yeah. at the end. So it's sort of, I was thinking it, you know, sowing the ideas, you know, the seeds of that idea where, you know, where that ended up. It's like, yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. You know, you can bring in these these influences, these ideas. Yeah. No, that was some good education, Mark, that uh, Phantom of the Opera is public domain. So I thought, okay. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, I had this idea uh, talking of, you know, plays because I'd seen, um, uh, of all things, it was Sweeney Todd, actually, uh, it was the Tim Burton version when I was in when I was in school in what you call high school, what I call secondary school, you know, depending okay. on which part of Scotland you, you stay in, you know, you call it, some people say high school, some people call it secondary, but I am um, because I'm a big Tim Burton fan. So I, I was saying, like, could we do could we do Sweeney Todd, you know, as a play? Could we do that? It's like we, we'd have to pay for it to do the music. But, uh, you know, we, we didn't do that. But that it's like that that would have been fun, you know. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, you know, just thinking, oh, gee, it's just really amazing talking to you, Mark. I'm trying to keep my train of thought. All totally great. Uh -huh. One of them, I'll, uh, I remember what I was going to say, uh, one of them is uh, in talking to Brandon Carrera and first draft scripts, I um, actually have a script that Brandon sent me, actually, from uh, I, from one of the episodes. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if it was one of Mark Loren Young's scripts and we could cover that one? But no, it's Ooh. actually, uh, it's Jeff Bearderman, I think is how, is how you say it. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, from, it's episode... Uh, it's one of the later ones. It's uh, A Friend in Need, which uh, featured Random Virus quite prominently. So again, one of one, one, one of my favorites. I do love that one. I thought, yeah, this is a great one to love and fear, you know, this character. Where it's, yeah. like, where it's like, nice job, Random. But I thought you were evil. You thought right. Hey, Random, nice work. But I thought you were evil. You thought right. <laughs> I'm like, oh boy, no, let's back off. He's insane. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. I'll annihilate all of you cowards. Hey, um, LF, he's, um, he ain't talking about us, is he? I'll annihilate all of you cowards. Hey, LF, <laughs> he isn't talking about us, is he? <laughs> oh no. Uh, where, where it's like, you know, everyone's, nobody's safe. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, it's funny uh, talking about slang from, um, you know, from the script. So I think with with that episode, it's it's interesting how close it is to the final product. Like there's some yeah. rearrangement story wise, and then there's some you know some like detail from the characters that they you know that they trimmed out. But it's basically there. But uh, Chuck talks to one of uh, one of Mark's friends from back in England, talking about uh, mooning a Spice Girl. I thought the Spice Girls, how how very of the time. <laughs> yep. So you mooned a Spice Girl. That's so awesome. My proudest moment. <laughs> I thought to myself, 
um, mooning. I thought I, I, I'm not. I wasn't sure what that was, but I googled that. I'm like, oh, it's exactly what I thought it was. And I thought, I'm surprised they threw that in a kids show. <laughs> you know. Yep. Uh, where you know now nowadays maybe not. <laughs> I mean, it, it it's just a joke. It's just verbal. But I thought, would that fly? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh gee. But uh, no, thanks. Uh, thanks for bringing up the play. The play is the thing because I, I did wonder about. You know, I thought, what what could I ask about that one, or what what would I want? What would I want to know? You know, for my potential review that I'm gonna. I say potential. I'm working on my review script now. Yeah. Know, but uh, yeah, I do have some uh, some favorite lines that I have from that episode, but also from from others. I'll see if I can. You know run through my my impressions of them okay but we'll come we'll come to that i have a couple of uh, questions there uh, a couple more questions but uh, with uh, yeah with we're talking about the radioactive guy there there's a there's some quotes i can do so some questions uh, some specific questions about episodes that you wrote mark um let's see okay. so, uh, in there's no place like home one of my favorites as i can say you, you wrote a lot of my favorite episodes of the show. I want you to know this. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. So uh, for, um, for There's No Place Like Home, uh, did you invent the name and backstory for the radioactive guy? It's such a fun, funny, and memorable nugget from the show. Do you, mem do you remember working on that one? Um, I'm trying to dig this up here because the very first version of it I think that was what we called unidentified superheroes in early draft. Uh, that is one of the uh, one one of the episode titles. I think you did do as well, actually. Yeah. So unidentified superheroes was not radioactive guy. Uh, no. Then let me check. So I'm sure, I have my notes on radioactive guy. So I think as far as um, as far as episode numbers go, I think that's episode six. I think I'd need to. Yeah, I think. Episode five or six. It's early, early in the show. Turn all up. Place the thing. Yes. I've just pulled it up. Captain Lightning. The Alter the Carnival. I am pretty sure that with Radioactive Guy, with the, the legend part of Radioactive Guy, sounds very me. Mm -hmm. Right? That that backstory and the history sounds like my kind of nerdery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it just, I mean, the only person I ever really dealt with on this directly was Rick to the point where I actually got to go to a cast party once. And I, I, I went on set once and watched, but didn't really introduce myself because I was too shy. Mm -hmm. So, and remember the shock when I saw the scene that I'd written in Chuck's room and Rick explained to me that this was now a standing set. I did not know what standing set meant, Okay, but it meant that they had built Chuck's room because I had thought it would be cool to set a scene in Chuck's room. And I was so completely freaked out by the idea that they'd spent all of this money because I just wrote interior Chuck's room. Mm -hmm. For a little while after that, I was terrified to write any interior extra I hadn't seen before because I just, I couldn't, I mean, remember, I can't, like I said, I came from theater. It's the idea that if I wrote something, somebody spent a lot of money on it just was so hard for me to wrap my head around. Right. So I'm like, so you built that because I used a different set. And Rick's going, yeah, I just thought that's really scary. <laughs> Oh, uh, but I remember going to a party at the rap party for I think it was season one and maybe it was season two. And the only person I talked to was Rick, who was my boss, the one woman who wrote my checks and Chuck's the, the dad of the actor played Chuck. But what do you do here? I sort of write because I, I, like, I did, I'd never met any of the actors. Was it? So it was a very weird thing where it's like, I knew who they all were, but as the writer, I'd never met them. And it felt really weird to say, hi, I wrote your words. I just, you know, I was less shy in later TV shows that I worked on. But with that show, for some reason, I was really shy about introducing myself. Mm -hmm. Was it, sorry, um, I think, um, uh, was it Mark's dad rather than Chuck's dad? Because I think uh, the, the funny, the, the, in, in the show. I'm pretty sure it was Chuck's, it was Chuck's real life dad. 
oh, uh, uh, do you mean Mark, Mark, Mark Minardi's actual dad or just like? Mark yes. Oh, I see. I understand. His actual dad. Oh, no, I didn't meet any of the actors. No. Oh, okay. Because okay. the actors all knew each other. I'm like, okay, I don't want to say hello. Mm -hmm. right. And I'm not particularly shy. And I'm definitely, like, I'm not shy around actors. Like, I act. I've got friendly friends who are actors. I just felt weird going, hi, I wrote your weird your words. Mm -hmm. Just something I couldn't wrap my head around it. No, I, I just I just wondered because uh, with uh, with Chuck um, in in the show, I think you hear his mum's voice in one episode. Uh oh, Charles Mugol, did you short out our electricity again? But you don't meet her, and you don't see. I I don't think you meet any of the kids. Um, you, or you don't meet many many of the kids' parents. And I was just thinking, was Chuck? Oh no, this wasn't the actor dad. This was the real life dad. Just the actual dad. It yeah. was the actual real life dad. Because mm. neither of us really knew what we were doing there. It was kind of weird. Oh, but there was like a relatability, like uh, dare, dare I say, fish out of water. On yeah, we were just kind of hiding in the corner together. Mm -hmm. I want. I wonder if um, Mark, Mark Minardi. I want. I wonder if Minardi is a is a French name or Italian name. It just kind of. The more I say it, it sounds like Boyardi, like Chef Boyardi. Yeah. Like that's uh, like that's cool. It's a great name. Yep. But also the confusing thing is because. Uh, Mark, Mark Minardi, his uh, his character name was Chuck, but um, Mark Hollander, you know the the character the character like the lead the lead guy played by Tom Wansey. It's just kind of it's kind of funny that um, you know the main guy is is named Mark, and they have an actor in the show whose actual name is Mark, but it's not the same. Yeah. person. I thought that must have been that 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 must have been confusing just a little bit. <laughs> but no, what what was the rap party like? You know, was it? Um, like did, did did you just interact with uh, with Rick and then Mr. Minardi? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, but no, it's uh, what what normally happens at rap parties. You know, how does it? it it's probably very different depending on what. The it's show is. it's so different from show to show, and I think it was would have probably been more different to the show with so many kids in it. Yeah. Right. So it's very tends to be fairly low key. Like I know that. Uh, Brandon Carrera on on the show, uh, you know, he was he was a child actor. He was he was talking about, um, you know, at that age, he didn't he didn't feel like you know I'm I'm a kid, you know, on this. He's like I'm I'm, I'm an adult, you know. I've got all this responsibility, and I'm I'm on a TV show. I thought, uh, yeah, but no, it yeah, would have been, yeah, it would have been different, you know, different energy levels because you've got lots of like teenagers in the cast, and then you know, like some some of the uh, some of the adults too. But uh, no, we're talking about the uh, the radioactive guy and the the in, the in universe like uh, you know legend. There, it's just really it's just really fun. You know, I'll see see if I can recall recall that. I was doing this impression for Brandon Brandon Carrera, but yeah, Doctor Cornelius Fowler was working late one dark and stormy night. Cornelius Fowler was working late one dark and stormy night. As you do. When he saw a comet coming from deep in outer space, maybe even another galaxy. When he saw a comet coming from deep in outer space, maybe another galaxy. <laughs> Where he's just like, that's my comet. Oh, that's my comet. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's the product of, of yourself, but also the late great R.D. Reed, which which is like a Scottish name, even though I think he was yeah. from Toronto, but he was really able to do that accent really well and use some of the language as well. But uh, somehow he came by the comet and brought it back to the observatory. I say observatory just because of where I'm from. The, yep. The, the observatory. The, the radioactive guy. Ugh. <laughs> but uh, so he somehow came by this thing and decided to bust it open because that's perfectly safe. <laughs> He's like, they said I was crazy, huh? huh? I'll show them. I'll show them all. They said I was crazy, huh? huh? I'll show them. I'll show them all. And uh, it was radioactive, and he just went completely insane. <laughs> yeah. He yeah, had great, and the guys. He boarded himself up in the in the tower, and uh, you know, outside it's just like Cornelius. We just want to help you. Cornelius, we just want to help you. You can't come in. No one can ever come in again. I'm radioactive. You can't come in. 
No one can ever come in again. I'm radioactive. I'm radioactive. <laughs> I'm radioactive. And, uh, yeah, that sounds like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Particularly as they say that his ghost still haunts the observatory, never leaving it. Waiting to attack. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> no, it's just so fun, so cool. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, no, thank you. No, just his, watching the show, uh, you know, the cast of adults in the show, like David Hughband, who, uh, you know, who played the coach, but also um, Diane Douglas, Mrs. Kutcher, the, you know, lunch lady, and then Mr. Chesbro. You know, they all have such, you know, funny moments. A lot of supporting characters in the show are really funny, too. But uh, really, uh, really quick question. Um, so it's in... Okay. Sorry, it's in Tunnel of Love. Um, did you write uh, rap lines for Mark Minardi um, that he did? He just did it, like, really briefly. Uh, or did I'm pretty sure that I did because I just checked my notes. Mm -hmm. And I have a question. Like, I actually have a question to Rick going, what is Chuck's last name? It will make it easier to come up with rap lines for him. Name's Chuck. Chuck Mugle. Yeah. So... But also at that time, I was part of a musical comedy duo. So writing fake raps and writing comedy songs was something I was doing all the time. Yeah, how fun. I'd seen it. It was an interview you'd done a, long, a little while ago, Mark, where you talked about your job in high school or like during, during the summer. Oh, when I was a sing, did sing telegrams? Yeah, I saw that, and I th this was actually what made me want to interview you. It was like it was like that moment in Gremlins where Mr. Peltzer is just like, "I gotta have him. He's incredible. I gotta have him. He's incredible." Like, <laughs> like <great. laughs> I was like, "He's." I've had very weird jobs. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was like this. This guy is fun. Let's get him. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So you were, you were interviewed by Jimmy Cagney. The guy behind the desk looks a little like Jimmy Cagney. And I walk in and he says, who are you? Mark? Great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gee. Because I, I, I wondered with the rap lyrics, I thought it could be like ad-libbing from, from Mark Minardi, kind of, or like a mixture of what you did, or even like, you know, Stacey Hirsch, who did the music on the show, who'd worked I would have previously. To, yeah, I'd have to find the actual script. But like I said, I actually did write, I, I do have my email to Rick saying, um, can I get Chuck's last name? It'll make it easier to come up with rap lyrics. Mm -hmm. So that kind of suggests I was jamming on rap lyrics. I'm Chucky M, yeah, that's my name. I'm Chucky M and I got game, 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 game. Mm -hmm. See if... Which episode was it in? Was it a place to think? Um, no, that one. Uh, that one's Tunnel of Love. I I forget. I forget the episode number, but uh, it it's not. It's okay because it it was some. It was just like these kooky moments that I can remember from the show because it, it's something that I watched. You know, all the time. You know, not not the entire season. You know, first season anyway because. Uh, with uh, with physical media releases, the the first season's all on DVD, but the the second season received no like physical media release. The whole show is on YouTube to watch now. But uh, I thought, what what do I remember? I did not realize it was on YouTube now. Yeah, it's actually in two different formats. Because uh, shout out to Joseph Marshall, who uh, uh, he and he and Rick um, know know one another very well. Uh, Joseph had taken from Rick's uh, video libraries V eight. VHS tape library episodes of the show that were in widescreen because the DVD that I have is four by three and the old YouTube uploads that they're, they're good but they're in four by three and so it's in widescreen I'm like oh this is cool I've never seen it like that before you know where is it when Chuck is playing air guitar I thought it would be cool to have him sing a really badass I'm so cool tune I'm Chucky and don't say I'm not I'm so cool I'm really hot 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 
Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what the deal is with rights. I know every show has its own nightmare when it comes to music licensing. Mm -hmm. I'd be delighted to make up song lyrics for an imaginary Born to Run type tune if you like, but just in case, if you're allowed to use a real tune, I figured I'd go that way first. I made up Dead Angels because I thought the name sounded cool and British. Uh Speaking of British, do you know if the British call themselves British or English? I went with English this time because it instinctively sounded right. Though I like the word British better. Hope you're having a great vacation. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Mark. Uh, th- th- this is a culture thing where, it, um, and it, it plays into the show as well, because when Mark uh, Hollander appears in America, when he moves there, it's it, it kind of depends on, on who's talking to him. Like some people would say, Oh, it's the oh, it's that English kid. Did you hear something about a party? Someone's having a party? Yeah, I think it's that English kid. Or you know, the bully character Wayne in the show would just be just be like, oh, it's 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 the Brit boy. Look, it's the Brit boy. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, he's Brit. Okay, so he's British if you don't like him, and he's English if if you do like him. He then or then again, just just call him just call him by his name. It's fine. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, gee. No, it's cool stuff. Lots of great music in Ace Lightning, you know, like the theme song and then, um, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, the themes that they were able to do for certain characters, most of which crop up in season two, like they would have like different music, I think because the composer was different the second time. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, that's no, that's an interesting story because, like, yeah, like copyright or you know things like that. It can be it can be difficult, you know, like buying, you know, even just buying music to use is costly, you know. Yep. But uh, talking about uh, Mr. Chesbro, specifically Mr. Chesbro and his uh, craziness, because he, he was able to play the radioactive guy who's nuts. We got that. Um, I remember having so much fun with him being crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, with uh, you know the start of that was uh, it was in unidentified uh, unidentified flying superhero kind of the yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, in unidentified flying superhero this was kind of the start of Mr Chesbro's delusions about Lord Fear and his gang being weird space aliens the connection to X Files makes perfect sense now as to probably why this nugget was in here so, well the other thing that makes me think that would have been me jamming is that when I like I actually interviewed Jillian Anderson, and David Duchovny mm-hmm. a couple of years after writing that episode of Reboot, and one of the most memorable moments from that interview was talking to Jillian Anderson and I said, "I know this is going to sound like a weird analogy, but I keep feeling like Mulder and Scully are kind of like Big Bird talking about seeing the Snuffleupagus." Oh, and I always love that image. Of, of this character who only appears to one person and everybody else thinks the person's delusional. So that would have just been a thing that I liked. Mm-hmm. I am a snuffleupagus. What what was was he? Well, he said he was a snuffleupagus. So, you know, it's possible not, but that's kind of my happy place. I actually really do like those characters that the snuffleupagus thing where only mm-hmm. one character knows they're real. Mm-hmm. So Chaseboro basically being the only person who sees Lord Fear, that would be my kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's that, it's that type of thing, I guess, because, uh, and they comment uh, after a while on this in the show where it's like these video game characters came to life and they're causing trouble yet. Nobody knows about it. And no one knows about it. But those who th- those who do like, there's very few that actually know what's what's happening. So like Chesbro, even though he's he's seen he's seen them and he knows that most of them are bad news, like the bad guys from the game. He's like, uh, yeah, but you don't actually you don't really know what they are. They're like they're they're not weird space aliens. <laughs> despite what you might think. <laughs> oh, here it is. Does Chuck have a last name? The reason I ask, it can be really fun to include it in rap lyrics. Mm-hmm. Then I've got Duff. Do you just want to blow him off in this episode? <laughs> I looked at adding the stuff about fear summoning him. Uh, fear moving the RV. Hubcaps. Yeah. So just down my notes. Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did nickname himself at one point where uh, he was hit by one of Ace's lightning bolts, and it's a good job he didn't sizzle. 
<laughs> yes. Good thing it was a deflected shot or he'd have sizzled. You know, <laughs> where it's like he had he got superpowers temporarily. And uh, his superhero name was Thunderfoot. Thunderfoot? <laughs> In one of the raps, he goes by Thunderfoot, and the verse was based on that. It's still really, really funny. Trouble with a T, that's my middle name. Kicking bootay, that's Thunderfoot's game. So uh, going back to minor characters, it's just a quick question. Uh, there was one guy, uh, this is also from Unidentified Flying Superhero. Uh, his name is Gus, uh, the tow truck driver, who um, he was sort of a, I, I really mean this nicely, I really do, but he was sort of a, a, a Canadian stereotype in this this American this American television show because he, yep. because he loved his hockey. First, they tried to get control of my mind by playing this weird sounding music, right? And that's when I grabbed my hockey stick, which scared them away. I think it's, I think it's just, again, when, when you're a kid, when you grow up, you notice the accent and just, just the way he was and how he talked. I'm like, yeah, he's, he's from Toronto or from, so, yep. you know, he's not American. This vehicle's impounded, pal. 50 bucks to get it out of here, or I'm calling the cops. 50 bucks? Yeah. Was it fun to write, you know, stuff for him? He was there just briefly. I don't recall, but if there was a hockey character, yeah, that would have been my happy place, too. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. Poser hockey character, that would have been... Yeah. That's him, that's him. That's sweet spot. Yeah. It's like they tried to get control of my mind by playing this weird sounding music, right? He's like, alien, you ain't probing me. Right? And that's when I said, hey... Alien, you ain't probing me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Even he, you know, he, he says, because he was talking about uh, Lord Fear and Staff Head, you know, the staff that he had, which is, again, yeah. another Skeletor, you know, homage going on. And he was like, uh, there was this little bat looking thing. It was on the end of a stick, had a British accent. This little bat looking thing. It's on the end of a stick. Had a British accent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. British, not English, right? <laughs> yep. No, it's funny. <laughs> no, that comes up a lot in uh, media from, from North America, but also just talking to people one-on-one one -on -one where it's like, oh, you're British. I'm like, yeah, but if you want to get technical, because it's like there are four kingdoms, you know, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. So it's like, yes, yeah. I am. But which one is it? Which of the four are you talking about? <laughs> no, it's just, it's just funny. Well, I was interviewed from somebody in Ireland by somebody from Ireland earlier today. Oh, fun! And talking about whale, like not your whales, the whales with an H in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you also have those whales, but yes. Hmm. But since you just brought up whales without the H, I figured I better be specific. Yeah, no, no, no. It's no, oh, it's cool. That that's very true. That that's very true, though. No, I'd be curious, Mark, to see because um, you were writing a book uh, recently. You met you met your you were you had a deadline for that one. No, I'd be curious to read some of what some of what you've written now because um, you know just how different it would be from you know the television stuff that you've been doing. Yeah. But uh, Mark, uh, do you know if um, yeah, this, this is a question about season two? I've got a couple of questions about season two here now, but uh, Mark had his own wrist cannon for the season. Do you know if it had a nickname uh, in like action lines or anything like that? Because I think on online it had like this nickname that I think fans gave it uh, the Super Glove of Doom. I believe, which uh, I love that name, but I thought I, I wish there was some canonicity to this. But uh, do you know if it ever had um, a name? Um. He has it for the whole show, for the whole like 13 episode thing of season two anyway. If you give me a sec, I will look while we are talking because like I said, I've got my files open. So that would not just have my scripts, it would have other people's as well. Um, let me pull up Ace. I have no idea whose script this is that I'm opening right now. I'm just looking up the word wrist. He points his wrist cannon. That is what we had in action lines. But no, it's cool. No, it was it was cool seeing him have like his own weapon, you know, in for season two because it kind of you know upped the game where there was there was more like directly combating the villains and not just um, you know like 
hiding from them, I guess, because that was more what the video game characters did, was just fight one another. But, uh, yeah. Yep, the official word. This is, whose script is this? The Master Plan. Uh-huh. Episode 230. I think that's finale, isn't it? That one is, yeah. We'll talk about that one, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think um, my favorite, though, uh, one of Mark's weapons pr- uh, pre wrist his own wrist cannon that he had, he had like a leaf blower and he used it on Rat and his face is just like as he's being blown back into the ice cream truck. I'm like, that was still a cool weapon. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, we need to up the game. We'll have him have his own have his own thing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, talking uh, not not just about the finale, but uh, like his whole uh, role in the show. Mark, uh, what was it like writing for Kilobyte's character? If you remember, wow, I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember if I had any any specific moments with Kilobyte. Mm. I have some favorite quotes from him. I can tell you the same. With, sure. The same. The same with uh, the other characters. It's like going through what's there. But uh, a note that you uh, that you sent me when we were going back over email, back and forth, was villains are always always is block capitals awesome, and they are. But they uh, are. Yeah. I remember really having fun with Lord Fear. Mm-hmm. Like the the sort of serious blahaha stuff is just fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, random virus like the villains who sort of switch sides. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You attack from behind when he wasn't looking. Now who's the coward? Yeah. That, that's a happy place, too. The sort of two-faced green goblin thing is fun. Mm, it's very X-Men as well, where it's sort of like a, you know, like that moral dilemma of people with superpowers fighting other people with superpowers. Or it's... Uh, that that's specifically what that one is, but I guess like most supervillains, like going back to Spider Man, you know, have yeah. um, you know, there, there's sort of a you know, there's sort of like an even you know match, I guess, going going on. But uh, yeah, one you know, one dedicates themselves to this side, and the other the other that side, you know. Yeah. No, the Jekyll and Hyde stuff is definitely there with random virus, which again is uh, you know kind of the Green Goblin thing, you know. Yep. But. Uh, I'll, t- I'll tell you what, talking of Kilobyte, I'll go, um, not talking about his character, but I'll jump to this question here. Uh, do you know if the concept for Kilobyte was partly influenced by Dracula as his weakness is sunlight or bright, well, bright light? And um, Frankenstein is also referenced towards the end of the show, too. It's like uh, the story of Frankenstein. Mad scientist creates monster, matter monster attacks creator, <laughs> then attacks the world. Because he was under the control of Rick, not Rick Sigilko, Rick the master programmer. Rick Hummel. Which that name is just like a, an inside joke on the show. Oh, total inside joke. Which, even if you didn't know, you sort of pick up on that. Matt, Matt Fickner confirmed this and i thought you I, know, I remember kilobyte being that. fun because kilobyte was was sort of had the all-powerful thing going on yeah yeah um but like i don't remember any specific lines mm-hmm. um just the vibe of it yeah yeah but yeah. you know and again getting to write getting to write the season finale was was kind of a cool honor mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right getting asked to do that episode was pretty darn cool Mm-hmm. But it's interesting because, like, I'm staring at a whole bunch of season three scripts. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. We'll talk. Oh, I, oh, that's really, really exciting because uh, that that sort of leads to a, another question. We'll go. We'll, I'll go through what we've got. Like, you know, yeah, with uh, with Kilobyte, I guess, um, as as a design. Um, by the end, speaking of Dracula, because he kind of he kind of looked like Nosferatu a little bit, just the way because he had no hair. Yeah like by the end and just like his long fingers and stuff like that. And um, I think um, with um, the universal monster in- influence, not that that's there necessarily, but you you know, yeah. just some of these nuggets that they put in there and 
just some of these ideas that you can piece together yourself. I guess um, it's not in the show ultimately, but I think when Matt Fickner was designing Kilobyte, there was this idea at one point to make him look like a virus, you know, to like this corrupting kind of force, which ends up being, you know, still his role in the show, but to try and visually make him look like that, you know, still with the tentacles, but have like more of a a little bit more of an abstract design. I think Matt was saying, I'll need to double check on that one. But also because uh, Kilobyte at the carnival turned into a Ferris wheel, that was like his hiding place. Matt wondered at one point about having, having him have long hair and him being covered in oil, like grease from the from the wheel. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, like creature from the Black Lagoon again, or like, you know, like a swamp monster. I was like, oh, that's really fun. You know, it's really cool. You know, but then like going, you know, the design is still really, really amazing. And then there was a, you know, like a in between design between like the virus thing and the swamp monster, almost greasy idea. You know, there was a prototype for what he ended up looking like ultimately with like his body armor and his his tentacles that he had, which again is like Dr. Octopus from, you know, Spider-Man. Yeah. Yeah, not not so much an influence on on the design or the character necessarily, but uh, you know that's something to pick up on. What was the first episode Kilobyte appeared in? Uh, that one is um, it's season two, episode four. Uh, I think Uninvited Guest is the name. Interesting, because I'm pulling up. Standing in the shadows, we see only the outline of his body as his tentacles slowly slice the air. Uh-huh. That's my that's the first reference I'm seeing. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. To kill a bite, and he doesn't have a name yet. Mm-hmm. Is that just like an early script that uh... Um What I did because I want I was obsessed with getting the characters' voices right. So I made my own master scripts that only made sense to me, where Rick would send me would send me all the scripts and I just compiled them all. And then when I was writing a character, I could basically word search like I'm doing right now. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to the top of Ace 1 to 208. And the first thing that I'm seeing, Kilobyte. Yeah. Standing in the shadows, we see only the outlines of his body is identical. So let's see here. Kilobyte. It's too late to save this world, Lightning. The trap has already been sprung and your fate is sealed. Yeah, yeah. It's too late to save this world, Lightning. The trap has already been sprung and your fate is sealed. That, that's in the show yeah. proper. That's a really good line. That is the first reference that I'm seeing. The Scrambler ride, Kilobyte morphed out of the ride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Scrambler was his uh, working name. That was what he was going to be called in uh, Matt Fickner's concept art, actually. Yeah, I mean, it may have just come out of being able to get a Scrambler for for that carnival. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like, they're, they're, you know, so for all of, all of the design aspects, there was a practicality Mm-hmm. which is they had a real working carnival. Yeah. These were the rides they had. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, they were rented. I was I was talking to um, Rupert Lazarus, who did uh, production design on the show, who's still hard at work now. He worked on a movie uh, called Possessor, actually, uh, Brandon Cronenberg, so David Cronenberg. Cool. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, oh, he did, because I haven't seen Possessor. I'm like, oh, he did that. That was fun. But a, a funny story is that uh, I got an email from uh, Rupert Lazarus, who said he was really touched that I reached out to him, because I said, you know, how important the show was to me and, you know, the design style. And I have on Blu-ray some of David Cronenberg's early films, which I was watching, I was doing research for, like, a writing project I'm working on now, and uh, was watching David Cronenberg, and then, you know, Rupert Lazarus contacts me. I'm like, oh, it's the guy who worked on Brandon Cronenberg's movie. It's just cool. the connection there. Like, I, I, I haven't heard from Rupert since, but, uh, you know, I told him this. I'm like, I have to tell him. That's funny. <laughs> oh, gee. We'll talk. Um, we'll talk briefly, just just about the you know the the end of season two. But all good. Um, but uh, do you know uh, season two was left on a cliffhanger, and while season three didn't happen, sadly, do you know if season three would have been the definitive end to the show? Because I understand that you know storylines were worked on and concept art was worked on too. But uh, you've got season three scripts that you were that you have there. Oh yeah, I mean I'm staring at season three scripts now, mm-hmm. and the introduction of a new character called Candy Floss. Yeah, and you know who I've got written, and I can't figure out whose line it is. 
like I'm trying to be respectful to do what, where I've got candy floss may even be tougher than kilobyte is the note that I just saw. Oh. And I'm not sure. Where was it? Um, okay, if it's take three, it must have been my episode. This candy, I've got Pete, this candy floss character sounds tougher than your mom's fruitcake. <laughs> Mark, yeah, she may even be stronger than random virus. What really worries me is it sounds like she's working with kilobyte. Pete, I thought you and Ace kicked Kilo butt permanently. If he's still in the game, you better watch yourself. Mm. I know. I just wish we knew what Kilobyte was up to. Mm. So, yeah. And there's Rick, Kilobyte Master. I was just leaving. So, yes, Rick has now been taken over by Kilobyte. Oh, oh. So, so in this version, Kilobyte's now the boss, and mm -hmm. Rick is definitely no longer the master. Yeah, which was his line at the end of uh, at, at the end of the season. He's like, "It's just a game. It's just a game. I should know. I'm the master programmer." It's it's just a game. It's just a game. I should know. I'm the master programmer. You were the master programmer. I'm the master now, and I won't rest until you take us back to the Carnival of Doom. You were the master programmer. I'm the master now, and I won't rest until you take us back to the Carnival of Doom. Get me out of here! Help me! Get me out of here! Help me! <laughs> Notes on Candy Floss. She is an unlocked character in the video game, which means a player has to find her in the game before she can become activated. It also means that the other characters wouldn't know about her. Kilobyte, with Rick's help, tells Heather how to find an unlocked candy floss in the first episode. They instruct her to burn a CD of the candy floss program, which activates the character whenever Heather puts the CD in her computer. At first, this is all that Kilobyte asks Heather to do. On Kilobyte's instructions, Heather can also give candy floss commands by typing them into her computer. Uh -huh. Candy floss morphs out of the cotton candy machine mm -hmm. in the carnival. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah. yeah, and yeah, Candy Floss is, uh, yeah, very cool character. No, completely. And again, questionable allegiances. Yeah, yeah. Why? Well, I think um, I think Matt Fickner wondered if um, Candy Floss would kind of replace Lady Illusion for Lord Fear, where those two were going to be a thing instead because lady illusion and ace you know became a, a couple and i know that um when matt was designing her i think i think that name was suggested to be used for the character and um i think originally uh, she was going to be called jawbreaker like the candy which yeah uh, you know and uh, be more like an alien with like blue skin or something i think is what what he was going for it's like I do really like the candy floss design. I don't know if, if you've got any images there, if you've ever seen it. No. But, uh, you know, it's it's still really cool. But no, that, that would have been interesting. You know, like one oh, way or there. Actually, this is cracking me up. I'm seeing a line that looks like it's Harley Quinn. Oh. Nothing cool. personal, Pudding. <laughs> yeah, I want to say that, you know, that the, the idea of, of her is kind of like Harley Quinn, yeah. But would pre but predates Harley, so oh, I see. Pretty sure, because mm. I know Mar Margot Robbie has that that line, you know, in the in Suicide Squad, and yeah, that's that's her. That's very her. Um, to Harley Quinn. Well, don't know. Harley Quinn's debut was ninety two. Oh no no the the movie Suicide Squad the David yeah. film yeah well Harley one of Harley Quinn's things is calling Joker Puddin yeah Puddin 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 But I w I did not know that one that line was written I'm sure because uh, mm. that was because I think at that point she was just in the animated series which I don't think I was watching at the time mm -hmm. so, and don't know when she picked up the Puddin thing. <laughs> I was going to say that that's more where I where I know her from, you know, complete with the red and black suit that she had. But uh, no, Mark, uh, did you get to see it was in uh, one of those emails? Did you get to see the concept art for uh, Buzz Beast and Candy Floss? You know, the Matt. Fitch? What's funny is that's what I was going to send you. I oh, was really? going through all of my files. I thought, 
Oh my God, William has to see these. What you <laughs> sent me was exactly what I had found where I was like, what's your address? You need to see these. Yeah. I, I thought Candy Floss looked amazing. I actually thought the designs just kept getting better and mm. cleverer, right? And yeah, those were characters that I thought would be fun to write. Mm. That was all I saw. Uh, Rick sent those over when we were working. And it was just like, I want you to know what you're working on. Mm. And yeah. So. Yeah, no, the thing with those is um, that um, for one thing, I was I was checking uh, Matt Fickner's sketchbook. And I think uh, the Busby drawing anyway, it says 06 on it, like 2006. So I guess that's when that was drawn. So that was uh, Ace Lightning season two anyway, didn't show in, in the United States anyway. In 2005, it, it showed in the United Kingdom. So I guess that's like 12 months on from, you know, from that one. And I believe that Alliance Atlantis was really ready to go for a third season of Ace. This is according to Rick uh, Sigal Co. Yeah. And I think um, the BBC, you know, who's the primary funder in the whole operation, was just like, we're, we're sorry, we can't sustain the production any longer. So the lid was put on that very sadly. You know more about that than I do. I just remember getting the call from Rick mm -hmm. and he was heartbroken and I was heartbroken. Yeah. And yeah, he said that my understanding was that the paperwork and the money just did not come together in time to keep things going. But I mean, he was, you know, as far as I knew, it was like all systems go. Uh -huh. And like, I actually remember where I was driving in Vancouver and pulling over the side of the road to get his call. And uh, way before handheld, like cell phones existed, handhelds did not, you know, like those, the nice Bluetoothy stream through your car things. So I pulled over to take his call because it was like, okay i've got a special ringtone for rick single call camera what it was and if that's about ace i gotta hear it and uh yeah not one of the happier calls i ever took i loved working on that show mm. no you know as, as a fan you know it's heartbreaking for me too and i think like um because with season one anyway i saw that on on the tv you know i was able to see a good chunk of it you know when it was broadcast in you know where i'm from and then it seemed to just kind of go away matt fickner was saying that it played once on the tv in canada and it did show around the world apparently it sold to like a like a hundred different countries and yeah i remember hearing that, that it was everywhere so I'm like, yeah. how could it be everywhere and not be on the air? That just... Yeah, it's a, it sort of doesn't television work. Television economics baffles me. Mm. So... Well, also, you know, I think, you know, spending so much time, effort, and, you know, a lot, a lot of money, because I know that the second season had a reduced budget compared to the first one, just for the number of episodes made, and watching it, you think, yeah, there's a, a reduction going on here. This is yeah. a slight against it. This is just a fact of the matter. But... Um, I, I don't know what the actual figures were, but that's, you know, it was it was a significant cut down. Yeah, yeah. budget numbers are above my level as a writer, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, no, no, that, that, we don't need to worry about any of that. But yeah, I think because it, it was translated, like subtitled and dubbed in different languages. And, you know, it, it seemed to be super, super popular just for that that time. And then it just yeah went away. But with season two, I wasn't aware that there was a second season, you know, until going on to the internet in like 2008. I'm like, what? There was wow. more after episode 26. Like, I have to see. Most of it wasn't online. I think people had vhs it off the TV. So people knew about it. But like, I, I didn't see it in full until like 2012, because that's when the whole season got put onto YouTube the first time. And it's been redone in better quality now. But I just thought, oh, it's great to actually see all these episodes and not just read the synopsis online. So I, I knew what happened in them. But, you know, obviously you want to see it. So it's not on any BBC channels or anything like that? No, it just sort of came and went. You know, uh, something I will show you. I uh, forgot to show you this last time. Uh, one of the discs I've taken out of the box. But uh, this is a DVD. Uh, this set is the first, the complete first season. And this one is actually from Hong Kong. Wow, I do remember seeing that. Mm. I think I saw that at a comic convention. Oh, really? Yeah, I think I saw that at a comic convention in Vancouver, Victoria. Maybe Toronto. Mm. No, it's crazy. Wow. No, there we are. Very cool. Mm. No, there's photos of that that box anyway on online. What I'll do, I'll open this. But... Uh, 
So we've got Ace and we've got Mark. Okay. Uh huh. Just get this here. I'm very curious. Have you talked to any of the actors? Like, where? what are they up to now? Especially the kid actors. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I, I've reached out to quite a few of them. So I spoke to Brandon Carrera, actually. It's tricky because, I, you know, they, they were, um, you know, like children. And some of, them, some of them are still acting and some of them are not. And it's just kind of... Kind of the same as if you're an adult like acting where um it's this competitive thing and uh yeah. you know they, they were all working like for a while you know where where it's like oh not everyone can be a big star but a lot of people are still still doing yeah. it so no i think some of them tom wansey who was the main kid mark and then Shadi yeah. simmons as samantha she was uh, uh i think they're both they're not acting anymore but they're still in like education like teaching people to be actors or like involved in english and drama and stuff like that i i don't really know like some some of them do have credits you know on on the internet but not not everything is listed on on imdb so well oh, absolutely well the thing is i when I was doing Ace, I lived in Toronto, and of course, all the actors were from Toronto. So if they were Vancouver actors, I'd know if they were still working, I'd, I'd have crossed paths. But mm -hmm. Toronto actors, less likely, right? Uh -huh. I might see them in a show or whatever, but I don't know that I'd recognize, you know, I, I'd recognize them at this age, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's that thing of, because um, I, I, I wanted to ask you last time about the rap party that, that you were at, where you met uh, one of the dads of uh, of the actor. Chuck's dad. Yeah, Chuck's yeah, dad. I, yeah, I just remember that being so funny because we were the only two people who didn't know anyone. Mm -hmm. And it was so weird because it felt like I knew them all because, of course, I'd been writing their dialogue all year. You know their characters, uh, but you hadn't, yeah. I knew their characters, I'd never met the actors. So it was very weird. It's a very weird thing because, like, because they've been in my head all year, mm -hmm. which, like, I, and I get that it must feel the same when you're watching a show and you run into somebody that you recognize from TV, but it, I think it's got to be, like, it's an extra level of weird when you're writing the show, you're putting the words in their mouths, and then you realize, oh, wow. You know, because I came in, I watched shoots and stuff just because I was curious, but I tried to be really discreet and not get in anybody's way. So I, yeah, I should have been a little less discreet and actually said hi. Oh, it's okay. You know, it's like it, you, you sort of think, or I, I sometimes have these moments like, I'm going to go in, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And then it's suddenly just like, oh, no, I'm shrinking back. I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. Or it's or it's the other way. It's kind of like these interviews that I'm doing uh, with, you know, I, it's so awesome talking to you, Mark, and I feel comfortable with this. But starting yeah. off, like, it was never recorded, but talking to Matt Fickner, it's just like, like, it's my hero, he's right there. I'm like, hey, and then you yeah. go, like, hey, Mark, how is, how's it going? <laughs> you know, and I thought, what else, what else can I do? <laughs> you know. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, talking of not recognizing actors now, uh, with Mr. Minardi, because that was Chuck, that was Mark, Mark Minardi is the actor's name. Yeah. Chuck, of course, you know. Uh, was Mr. Minardi, was he like a, um, was he like a muscly guy or was he not, was he not really? I don't think he was particularly, but like, I don't have huge memories of him. Yeah. It was just like, I had assumed he was crew because, you know, at the party, he's like, nope, I'm chaperone. Yeah. Hung out with him in a corner for a bit. He was lovely. Oh, sweet. Yeah. No, I only ask, you might be thinking, why, why, William, are you asking me this question about his body type? It's just that because uh, Mark, Mark Bernardi, he was, he was kind of a, kind of a broad boy when, yeah. he, when he was younger, anyway, in the first season. In the second season, he grew significantly and was kind of a leaner guy. Seeing his social media photos now, he's this really muscular, like bodybuildery kind of guy now. And he has, cool. like, I know, and he has like a shaved head and he's just like, He's just sort of like, you know, wow. is that him? Is that, it, it doesn't, it, I can tell it's him because, you know, you recognize him, but he just looks so different, you know. That'll be a fun thing to put in your videos. It's like the before and after. That's kind of like him at 14, 15, whatever he was. And mm -hmm. him now, that'd be pretty cool. I think he's, um, I think they're all like 10 years older than me. I'm, I'm 26 now. So I guess, yeah. I guess they're like 36 odd, something like that. But yeah, you see Mark Minardi now, it's like, yeah, he could kick our ass. <laughs> <He's>, Funny. You know, <laughs> uh, I'm sure he wouldn't, but uh, it's, it's <laughs> you know, he, he looks like a like a bouncer outside of a nightclub, just 
just just sort of like how's it going you're not gonna cr- nice. try and cross me are you okay have a nice night very cool <laughs> So um, could I ask, Mark, uh, it's about the second season uh, with Ace Lightning, yeah. the titular character. So um, do you remember what it was like writing for Ace in season two because he was given these uh, human emotions by the bad guys just to try and try and throw his program off? And, you know, he was pretty unstable as a result. Try harder or you can find another superhero to cover your sorry butt. What happened? It's my fault. I couldn't control my anger. Yeah, I just I remember it being a bit more fun because changing things up for Ace was cool. Uh, just because you were playing with a very straight laced superhero, you know. So to change up the vibe of that's always great. You know, he was play, He was a very Supermanish superhero early on. Just follow the code of the Lightning Knight. Do right, and fear not. I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. <laughs> and to shift that was fun. I mean, it's the same thing I think Superman writers must get when they mess around with their characters. And, you know, it's what I think it's really, it's why they created things like Red Kryptonite. Yes, let's have Superman get wacky. No. So, <laughs> Yeah, just trying to yeah try trying to throw throw things off. You know, I'm glad you said that about Ace because uh, I I find you know the characters in Ace, particularly the video game characters, where I yeah. think the the A story to the whole show is about the teenagers and what they get up to, and then the, the B story. Just lo- looking at the the amount of animation sequences, rewatching the show, like the B story is the the superhero-y stuff, but uh, as a child. I guess it just depends on how you take it, where you're like, I'm yeah. more interested in the superhero stuff. I'll speak for myself. And this is just me. I know I'm not alone, where it's like, I kind of like the bad guys more than the good guys. Just And this is the the difference between something like this and like the Batman comics in that, you know, I love Batman, but I also really love the, the villains as well so much. Yeah. Batman has, without a doubt, the best villains of any superhero. Yeah. Right, like to the point where most superheroes, their villains are modeled after Batman's villains. Yeah, yeah. Right, like Batman's villains are the prototype for Spidey's villains, Flash's rogues gallery. You know, although you know, I also get into the fact that, to my mind, the reason it must be so hard to write Superman is they've been writing Superman for so many years, mm-hmm. and they've come up with like what two A level villains. Mm. Luthor and Brainiac, two eight, like that's it. And Brainiac isn't even iconic. Like, if you ask a casual person which Superman villains they've heard of, it's Luthor, yeah. maybe Zod from the movies. Mm-hmm. So Superman's existed almost a century now, mm-hmm. like not not quite. And they, you've got really one iconic villain, mm-hmm. Batman, same time frame. And you could walk up to somebody in the street and they could name a dozen, a dozen Batman villains, right? Just casually. Uh, you could walk up to, you could walk up to a stranger and they could name five, six Spider-Man villains. I was going to say, yeah, sorry. But Batman villains? Mm-hmm. Or sorry, su- Superman villains? No. Yeah. I was going to say, because with, you know, comic book villains, stuff like that, Batman for sure, but then also Spider-Man and then even like some of the X-Men villains as well, like Apocalypse or... Oh. You know, X-Men has a spectacular rogues gallery. Like that's one of the comics that does it. I wonder if, because Rick had said in an interview a little while ago now, uh, shout out to Joseph Marshall. Thank you so much, Joseph. Rick was saying, um, he said, as one writer said to me, all all the powers have already been taken. So I I don't know if that was Denny O'Neill or if it's just kind of common sense with any any reader or writer when it comes to comics. You you know, you're, you're like, this bucket is empty. It's like... Well, sure, but you know how how do we do a different kind of superhero? You, Absolutely. How do you d- take these things that you might well recognize in your case? How do you take these things and try and put a, a different spin on it? And I think it's only um, as you grow up and see more more media, you kind of pick up on these things because no six year old kid, me, 
watching Ace Lightning in 2002 is is that familiar with with the comics unless you know like Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2 like the Sam Raimi movies were coming out yeah in those when that show was being made and I don't know if if any of that was influential uh those movies uh especially the second one when the show was being made because that was it's like we're doing our yeah. thing they're doing their thing you know yeah if, if any powers were missed prior to Chris Claremont on X-Men Chris Claremont finished them off and got all the rest. Oh, somewhere you know, some somewhere he he made a mutant with whatever power was out there that was possible. Um, you know, it was kind of astonishing what he did with that run, and yeah, so all the powers probably have been used, but mm -hmm. doesn't mean you can't keep spinning out great great new characters. Yeah, because it's like who who they are that makes them you know interesting. It's not just what they can yep. do. Of course, it's the endurance of these things. And I think that's why, like going back to Ace Lightning, that because he is this kind of straight laced by the book good guy, nothing wrong with any of that. He has these flaws, you know, and lessons to learn as well during the whole run of his, his character in the show. Yeah. But I think perhaps it's because with season two, they aged it up and made it a bit more teenagery so that when you, the audience, grew up, it kind of grew up with you. Or the other way around yeah. so no I, I just find ace a lot more interesting in season two because he's corrupted with these unstable human emotions and it's kind yeah. of it, it's like the hulk it's like the hulk trying to control himself and be a better guy and also like um you know like an adolescence kind of metaphor you know or perhaps yeah. i was a teenager reconsidering the show and I just sort of like, oh no, I got what this was about now, I, or it means more to me. What if you had spent your entire life with a computer program telling you what to do? Then one day, bam, the program's gone and you're stuck with all these weird new feelings. Was all of that intentional? Oh, I'm sure it was. You know, I mean, that's really a Rick question. Yes. But it, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me that you just go, all right, how do we, how do we change this up? How do we make Ace a little more interesting? Because I mean, so often the villains are going to be more interesting than the heroes because the heroes don't have as much going on. The hero's job is to fight the villain. If the villain isn't cool, you don't have much. Yeah. Right? No. It's like, it, it, seriously, it's why as a kid, I just, like, I felt like I read everything except Superman. Because mm. I just go, you know, Hulk smash made more sense to me because Hulk was interesting. Yes. Uh, yes. So, you know, Hulk spoke, like, the classic Hulk where, you know, Hulk was not intelligent, still felt like better storytelling overall. Mm -hmm. Then Superman was like, yeah, Lex Luthor's come up with another doomsday ray. Great. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and then they invent doomsday, who's basically an intergalactic Hulk to stop mm -hmm. him. And again, like pretend that's an A-level villain. Yeah. Maybe the um, strength of the character, but not, not, not as an actual thing, you know, not, not, yeah. Seriously, compare Doomsday to Doomsday as the as the villain who ended Superman ever so briefly to Bane as the villain who ended Batman. Yeah. Bane is still sticking around mm -hmm. and Bane is a great character and is so flexible that Bane becomes something entirely hilarious in Harley Quinn. If you're watching the Harley Quinn TV series, right? Like there's so it's such a rich character. Spider-Man, where we started. And Spider-Man, where I think Ace started, because it really felt to me, the Ace villains really felt to me like Spider-Man, early Spider-Man villains. And all of those are great parts. In Ace, all of those are just chewy, fun parts, right? Like, if you're an actor, I think you had a really good time in the recording studio doing those pieces. Did you receive much material on Candy Floss? All I think all I really got on Candy Floss was the image and the most basic details. With all of those characters, I think we got the images, but we haven't started writing yet. So, because until, basically until the money's there, they don't get the writers going. So we'd had conversations about writing, but yeah, I don't recall doing anything beyond, you've got to check these characters out and me going, that's really cool. Matt, did, Matt came up with such cool images for that. Mm. Yeah, I think um, with that one, because uh, I know you, you read some of uh, some material from season three that, that was there. Yeah. Was was that um, was that basically all, all that was made? You know, ba basically. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh -huh. I kind of thought, you know, I thought I don't really know what else could have been done. We've got like a basic outline there. But what was interesting and this connects to 
you know, the storyline of what would have happened with the kids. Uh, you know, Heather, one of the characters, um, more one of the side characters, was given control of Candy Floss from what the script seemed to be saying, you know, which yeah. is certainly something a lot more to do for her character. And it's, you know, I guess it would kind of serve as, as revenge in a way, like picking up from the last season because uh, Pig Face had this superpower where he could launch projectile snot, like late name yes. fluid, if you remember, and that she got doused in that. <sighs> So when I knew that, when I read that, I thought, right, revenge time, click. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but yeah, that was so great. <laughs> yeah, Rick had a good sense of sort of smart, gross kid humor. Uh -huh. so, Which there's a lot of in Ace Lightning. It's kind of that early yes. 2000s kind of gross out comedy style which yeah. i really love and you know looking back knowing how things were made it's like oh no this fits all in the, the yeah spots, all those tropes <laughs> yeah um no i wonder you know stemming from that i wonder what would have happened with the kids in you know in season three because they'd gone to high school and they would have probably gone still further through that uh do you know what could have happened there not really although i'm fairly certain because of the ages that they were aiming for that they wouldn't have done that Buffy thing and sent them to college. I think they would have been in high school for as long as the show ran. Mm -hmm. That's, that's my only prediction on that. I would have been really surprised if they graduated because I mean, in classic high school shows, kids never graduate. No. Right. You know, like there are the, there's the odd exception, but they're rare and mm -hmm. don't usually do well. Yeah. So, well, I know with, yeah, I was going to say, you know, you mentioned Buffy, which I've seen in its entirety, along with Angel, yeah. because it's on Disney Plus now. And uh, yeah, I think it, Joss Whedon's vision for the show was to have them grow up through it. And, you know, it's interesting and different. But I thought, you know, for this show, I thought, well, it, it never really had legs for that. I don't think I think it was more aimed at like a younger audience. And this is all it was also goofier. It was always goofier comedy. Yes. So it wasn't, it would have been a total tonal shift to go, hi, we're going to switch from goofy comedy to something where our characters could conceivably in first, be in first year university. No, no, that wasn't really no. how it was built. Well, I think with Buffy, a, a, lot, a lot of people really like the first three seasons where it's like those years of high school. And then it kind of depends, you know, there's good stuff thereafter, but it's a different story because she went to college and she got a job. Yeah. It, it was just like life stuff kept going. And yeah. th th that's not Ace Lightning. We're, we're not going to do that no. kind of superhero -y story. But like talking of aging up the show, like just based on, you know, the design of Candy Floss, how, you know, how she looked, it was like Harley Quinn and some of the, some of the, some of the comics. Anyway. Yeah. She's like underdressed. And uh, <laughs> I know Matt was hesitant. I think it was the BBC's idea to call her Candy Floss, which is, what you guys call cotton candy. You know, it's that kind yes. of carnival. I'm sure you know. I remember Jawbreaker being one of the designs I saw. And in Canada, it's cotton candy too. Uh -huh. Sure, sure, sure. The, the Canadian version of cotton candy is cotton candy. But I guess the American version is candy floss. Um, I don't know. I think in Britain, it's candy floss. And, you know, and then in America, it's also cotton candy. You, you would have a better idea. Yeah. Aging up the show because Buzz Beast as a character had like a big circular saw or a big buzz saw in his body and his tail. You, th you think to yourself, would this be, is this going to be a like a darker show? Is this going to be violent, you know? Well, but again, response? that goes back to being a Spider-Man character, mm. right? Like Gladiator had the saw. So going back to my take that this was, this is very much a early Spider-Man vibe, that goes back to that early Spider-Man vibe. And even Candy Floss, like you kind of go, okay, that's, sort of a black cat vibe. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I still think there was there was a real early Spider-Man, Peter Parker, still young kind of vibe to it. I'm sorry. If, La if Lady Illusion were like Catwoman, then, you know, uh, Candy Floss yeah. kind of like Black Cat. Because I, I think, um, did you receive much material on, on Buzz Beast? Like, that's really the last question that, that I have. 
Same thing. I just got a couple of images. Wish there was more. Wish I got to write for them. Mm -hmm. It might have been tricky because I think in Matt's mind, and this is something you would have to change for the TV show, but I think in Matt's mind, Buzz Beast wasn't going to talk. He was just going to be like a monster that roared and stuff. And I was asking him, would he have talked? Like, would you, at least in designing him, did you imagine the character that way? And he told me no, but I think um, you would have to do something, you know, maybe even get oh, the voice in. I don't know. You can pull off non-speaking characters. They can be fun. Oh, no, no. I'm not saying it wouldn't work or wouldn't be any good. Yeah. I just thought to myself, for the sake of equality with the rest of the characters, you might want to give him a voiceover or not, or use him in the right yeah. way. Because I thought with season three, you know, television, television doesn't end. Film ends. Yeah. Yeah. Television doesn't end film ends and i'm like even though because season one had this definitive ending the door was open but it felt like an ending season two yeah. deliberately had the door open for more and i don't know if season three would have been the definitive end because you would hope that it would go on for as long as possible but yeah you know no i'm with you i wish it was still going yeah, well, you know, maybe, you know, I was saying to Matt, like, maybe we could make something, you and me, or like, uh, you know, we'll, I'll fund it, I'll make it, I'll do it. <laughs> nice. Or I'll phone up the BBC and be like, have you still got, you know, this show in your archives? Oh, you do. Can you re-release it, please? You know, I'll purchase it and we'll make it popular again. Unless you're a fan of it now, you're not going to look for it. But it's kind of, kind of receiving some attention. So who knows? Nice. I love your enthusiasm for this, William. This is so cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. We've hit all the stuff you need, right? Oh, yeah, totally. No, this is really valuable material. Like, you know, I'll be able to use this in my review, you know, for the cancelled season three. Just a quick comment. We'll need to wrap up soon. With BuzzBeast, conceptually, I think Matt Fickner imagined that the bad guys would take the DNA of Pigface and try and create this new thing. So he wasn't... Um, from the game he was just like invented and i thought that's something different you know it breaks yeah. a little with what we did but like it, it explains looking at him why his face kind of looks the way it does like he has those big teeth like pig face had those big tusks so it's got like you could have an in-story reason for why he looks like this or it's just like a joke on matt's part like you know they took this who took that because that was their thing it's like we'll use technology to try and summon the characters back out of the game because they've been put back in their boxes again the show doesn't yeah. say that but that's it's one of the ideas they had. Well, Mark, once this is out, I'll share with, you know, share with you, you know, sharing my work with you. And uh, no, it's been a real pleasure. It's been the greatest thing ever to talk to you, sir. Thank you so much. And I love your enthusiasm. And if you talk to any more people from the show, please send my love and my thanks. All right. Take care. I'll see you around, Mark. You take care. Thank you so much, William. All right. Bye. Bye. It's hard to take a stand, it's hard to do what's right. No matter how scared you are, you have to stand and fight. And we don't have to play this game all alone, cause there's a hero. There's a hero in us all. There's a hero. There's a hero in us all. What's a hero in us all? You have to do what's right. You have to do what's good. It's hard to stand and fight when you're misunderstood. And we don't have to play this game all alone, cause there's a hero. There's a hero in us all. There's a hero. There's a hero in us all.
to hear a win us the world can be such a lonely place ching 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 when there's not much out for you at home you at home if i'm in trouble i can count on ace i don't have to play this game alone there's a hero there's a hero in a song There's a hero There's a hero in a song There's a hero There's a hero in a song There's a hero there's a hero, there's a, there's a hero in a song, with a hero in a song.